if you're here for the first time, I would say definitely take advantage of all the networking opportunities, take advantage of all the speakers, all the presentations, take great notes and make lots of contacts and get lots of business cards. Make sure you hit the breakout sessions. I think they, they'll learn a lot of information, good information about where DIA is going, where the intelligence community is heading overall. Uh, always excited to catch up with uh, my peers, frankly, because we don't get to do that enough. Uh, but to hear senior leaders like we're hearing from Senator Fisher and General Cotton right now, to hear what their priorities are, always helpful. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the DOTUS conference. I hope everyone enjoyed the socials last night and you're ready for another exciting day today. As a reminder, please silence your cell phones at this time. Also, if everyone could please check your pockets for your cat card. If it's not there, it's at the registration desk downstairs. <laughs> Kicking off day two, we have a fireside chat with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency Director, Vice Admiral Frank Whitworth, and the DIA Chief Information Officer, Mr. Casa. Please welcome Vice Admiral Whitworth and Mr. Casa to the stage. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us again this morning for our fireside chat to kick off day two. We are with Admiral Whitworth. And just by way of background, Admiral Whitworth is the eighth director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, started that role in June of 2022, right? That's right. And you've had several roles within the IC and DOD. Previously for joining NGA, uh, you were the joint staff J2. Yep. And, uh, spent also a significant amount of time working at combatant commands to include CENTCOM, JSOC, AFRICOM, uh, and various roles throughout your career, even as a uh, White House intelligence uh, desk officer, which That's was right. uh, fascinating. So quite, quite an extensive career. But in your current role in NGA, uh, the, the mission has changed over time. When I, 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 my first job in the IC was actually at NGA. And I was telling I folks that. yesterday, I was, uh, I was a database administrator. I heard that. Uh, and this was post 9-11, so this was in the early 2000s. So our focus was really Iraq, Middle East. Yeah. That was, that's, where, that's where all of our emphasis was. That's changed over time. And that was actually with NEMA. So the focus was on IMINT at the time, imagery intelligence. Uh, obviously with the stand up of NGA, expanded into GeoInt. Uh, and then the mission also changed. Uh, so let's just start there for today. Tell yeah. us about how, uh, how NGA's focus has changed and, and where that operational uh, mission as, as assessment function is. Where, where are those emphasis areas? Thanks, Doug. Um, first off, it's great to be here. I have actually, if you calculate over the course of the career, the amount of time I've spent either in GIOX or with DIA, um, it's a substantial number. About two thirds or so of my career has been you know, with your organization. And so it feels right to be here right now. Now on behalf of the 16,000 people of NGA. And I'm really proud of them. And you know, I chose that music uh, intentionally because the idea here, you know, we have, we have LNOs all over the place. We have what we call NGA support teams at all of the COCOMs and services, a lot of other agencies. And we're all over the place. And if you're a decision maker, or if you're a trigger puller or some sort of an operator out there with the joint force, or if you're a first responder trying to do some homeland security or doing some homeland response, everything's gonna be all right if you've got NGA on your side. And you know, I had this conversation with the Navy recently. We pay for one rider uh, from NGA to be on the carrier strike groups. We choose to pay for that. Uh, because the image that I want, uh, at least for those 7,000, you only have 7,000 people within a carrier strike group, is that they just inherited, by virtue of that one ship rider, they just inherited the talents and the time and the energy of 16,000. And that's the way, in my discussions with some of those commanders, that's the way they feel. 
So when you think about operational focus, which is the nature of your question, I could go any number of places. Of course, I have to go to the pacing challenge that the Secretary of Defense has identified, which is China. And I'm really proud of the team over the past year and the way that we've stayed ahead of some of the occurrences in the South Pacific and South China Sea and uh, in our support of some of the great alliances that occur there, especially in maritime domain awareness. And you know, we have worked on a tool called Enhanced Domain Awareness, which helps us monitor uh, some of the behavior related to unregulated fishing that is a real problem for some really important countries out there. And so, of course, I have to just begin with keeping pace with that pacing challenge. Russia, Ukraine has been a staple for us for a long time, uh, and it's been over two years. I'm really impressed with the ability of the team to keep pace with monitoring day-to-day -day tactical, at the same time keep tabs on strategic. Uh, and then I saw a new gear within our workforce on October 7th, a year ago, uh, when we had what occurred in the horrors of uh, the Hamas operation against the Israelis, where we were called upon by the president to ensure that Israel could defend itself against Hamas and regional threats. And we've lived up to that. And I'm really proud of the team also in keeping that operational focus and ensuring that we tell the entire story. So that if there are things to know about the environment, to understand the environment in Gaza or elsewhere as it may relate to the humanitarian situation and the amount of uh, damage or destruction, we're telling the entire story. There's no shaping at NGA. I could offer the same thing with our operational focus in terms of telling the tale of and being predictive on North Korea and some of the launches uh, that they've had recently, uh, ensuring that we also keep an eye on this very important axis of supply that's occurring that involves both Iran and North Korea. In some cases, uh, having an instrumental role in exposing that activity and ensuring that our decision makers have what they know to talk about it and respond to that. So, uh, you know, the last thing that I'm going to mention and it kind of goes to that music again, everything's going to be all right. That's kind of the, that's the visual and the audio that I have with our deployers who are called upon by a lawful request from FEMA at a time that some assistance needs to be made to Americans. And in the case of Milton and Helene, these two hurricanes that had devastating effects, we got the call. At one point, we had 20 people on the ground with one of our trailers that we have that's already pre-wired for communications and for printers and, of course, our exploitation equipment for lawful collect through commercial. And they made a difference in identifying grid reference maps and waterproof maps and that kind of thing that go out to all those searchers and allowing them to organize themselves. And there was even an unprecedented use and lawful use of really carefully controlled uh, you know, uh, entity for some drone technology to go in places that humans just couldn't get. It was completely impassable. And then we also had up, upwards of 25 people working this mission remotely. They didn't have to be there. They were just working on it remotely, again, through commercial and unclassified uh, visual imagery analysis. And so, I, I, you know, I think uh, your question is exactly right. We could spend 30 minutes talking about the operational focus of NGA. So thank you for that. Yeah. So in all of those operations, NGA obviously collects and processes a lot of data, makes sense of it, disseminates it to those that need it. Um, when, I, when, I was, when I was there in NEMA, uh, someone told me most of what we do hits the cutting room floor. And as a database administrator, I would always get the request, because I did the visualization and everything else as well, of you know that Amazon thing where it says, if you, if you like this, you might also like this. Everyone wanted that, of tell me what I should be looking at. And so now, obviously, almost 20 years later, more than 20 years later, we're talking about AI and the opportunities with AI. Can you talk about that and what GeoInt AI is, is uh, advancing towards as your time as the director? Yeah, the preface to your question was about scale, and I think that uh, this is a story of scale. And it's appropriate that uh, we've, we've inherited uh, this responsibility for GeoInt AI because GeoInt has a scale like none other. 
you think about the number of ones and zeros that we transport across this globe, it's, it's, it's without peer in, in the agencies, at least of the United States. And so uh, going for the hardest thing first, addressing AI for that hardest thing, which is this massive network, I think is, uh, is correct. So to answer your question, it's been a banner year. I'm going to address tradecraft and standards and then talk a little bit about the future. And let's talk about tradecraft because we have to baseline what everybody knows about the way AI applies to GeoEnt. So typically a human will go through an image which is a file, which is data in and of itself. It's ones and zeros and it's very dense. Anybody who's taken a picture on high res accidentally and you try to send it and it just chokes, you know the deal. That's us times gazillions, right? So the human is looking for an object or a behavior that is really, really small relative to that field of view. And to give you some idea, most everybody in this room, if you came through an airport, was treated to the marvels of computer vision. So your mug was up on a sensor, either at TSA, Global Entry, something like that, and you marveled at how it identified that's you, and you can pass, right? Uh, if it were only so easy in our work, because your mug is about 80% of that field of view. What we're looking for, unique behaviors, anomalous things, objects, etc., is about two one hundred thousandths of a percent of that field of view. So I think you have an idea of the challenge here. So how do you do it? You, you run as much data, and that's where the coffers that we already have become so powerful, because you run as much data through a process that involves also data labeling, identifying what that object is, and then ultimately creating a model. So that then, when that data runs through the model, it's, it goes through what we call running inference, which then runs into detections that we, as humans, can use. It accelerates and adds scale to this otherwise very tedious process. Right? Mm -hmm. So there are some, now that we have like hit the, just the tradecraft itself, let's talk about some of the tools that have made some advancements over the year. NGA Maven is now a program of record. It is being employed by real world combatant commanders, and there are at least four now who have it, and I want it to be more, and I know the CDAO and the Department of Defense does as well, and we're working on that. For real world operations, and that's very, very significant. NGA Maven is effectively a, a process that involves what I just described in GON AI and identifying opportunities. And where it has made its mark here recently is in the combination also of a graphical user interface that is very agile, where a commander can say, I, want, I, I treasure knowing the confidence of what's out there in terms of opportunities but I also want to have a little bit more in the targeting cycle. So it's applied mainly to the targeting cycle. And for us, we're, we're really into target development, so it's very helpful in the scale of target development and identifying those opportunities. But it, it also is attractive to the J3s and the J4s of the world and the commanders of the world because they can add other aspects of that cycle. And our detections, to answer the question of how you doing now in NGA Maven, our detections are way up. I'm not going to go into how high they are, but they're way, way up compared to where they were when we inherited the program over a year ago. The models are way up. I was asked a question when I first inherited, do you think you'll just stick with one model? And it's not that. Uh, we have a lot of models because models can be tailored to different situations and different uh, pieces of ground. So that's NGA Maven, and that's targeting. Another concentration area for us, warning. This is the big industrial geoint. Targeting is rather acute, campaign-based. Warning is global. This is where you're establishing a baseline of objects and behaviors out there, and you want some cueing that something's out of place. You want some cueing that there is something anomalous. And this is what the professionals of NGA spend most of their time and energy on. We want to prevent surprise. There is a program known as Aspen that is attempting to use AI and really good modeling 
to that end. And it's, about, it's not just about detections and it's not just about inferencing, it's about the entirety of keeping your stuff organized in workflow. To include GIS data, to include nav data, uh, and with accuracy uh, geospatially. We're really into geospatial accuracy. If there's one thing you take from this morning, it, it needs to be, you can detect all you want, but if you don't know where on the earth it is with precision and accuracy, you've got a problem. Yeah. Then there's navigation. And what I would like to identify as kind of fire and ice uh, is an application of AI in very real terms. For instance, ice flows up in the Arctic, we have an AI model that actually helps us stay ahead of that, which is really important for navigation. On fire, we have a model that helps the National Guard identify flashpoints that are occurring across this nation, at least. So, um, you know, we have a responsibility for the safety of navigation that many Americans don't recognize or realize, and that is if a plane is going into an airport, and I'm talking especially about a DOD plane, or leaving it, it needs to have reliable data of every obstruction, and that does change. And that's why we drive so many requirements that aren't just about warning and aren't just about targeting. Safety and navigation can never be forgotten in this regard. Yeah, when I, when I was uh, involved in this uh, quite some time ago, it, it, was, it was the shift from NEMA to NGA, and the tagline was know the, know the earth, show the way, right? Which was the, the focus of the world. And the way we define the world was only through 12 scenarios, ranging from counterterrorism to natural disasters. Yes. But if there was a problem that didn't fit within those 12 scenarios of modernizing the world, it just wasn't important, right? It was outside the scope of what we were looking at because there was just too much to deal with. Too many scenarios, too many types of data, too many types of missions. So I, I've heard about NGA's digital twin effort to develop a living model of the world to try to get a handle on that. Can, can you explain what that is? Yeah, and so now you're moving into the future, and I forgot on your last question to move into the future very quickly on AI. And, and, to, and in one word, multimodal. So what I've been describing thus far on AI has largely been advances in computer vision. And we've been doing computer vision for a long time, but the advancements are now accelerating as, as frankly, the models and, uh, and some of the uh, um, tradecraft is improving. Now how to combine text and images. And that's multimodal and that's where we're, we're literally um, very excited about this. We, we want to ask questions about geospatial environments and get answers that are multimodal in, in context. And we have actually gone with an R&D foundational contract with Microsoft to come up with something like that. And that will be the beginning, the, the, the world will be our oyster in that regard. Back to your question on foundation digital twin. This gets to the navigation mission that I was talking about before. And there's a progression really if you think about this over time. It started with maps, good old fashioned, like literally just a two dimensional map that people would keep and hold and use to move from point A to point B safely. And we certainly had responsibility for that. Then it started, then imagine a vault where you have tons of maps and you get into volume for contingencies where, wherever you, if you're a deployer, a military force, et cetera, you had to have a lot of maps. And we got into that. And then we started recognizing that this is more efficient when it's done as a file. Mm -hmm. And so electronic maps have been uh, really uh, where we've been moving for the last decade or so. And so they're files, but again, they're individual files. The idea of foundational digital twin is to create a layer, a place where no matter where you are, you have foundational data of the earth that you can count on to move from point A to point B safely. So what's key to this and why are we making actually more progress today than ever? It's largely because of the three dimension, the three dimensional piece of GeoInt and the advancement we've had in the last year or two really. So precision and accuracy on a map is really, it's not just X and Y coordinates. People think it's just lat long. To be really, really precise, it's all about the Z. It's all about elevation. So when we say three-dimensional GeoInt is improving, therefore foundational digital twin is improving, it's real. And I have metrics for this. Our Office of Geography, in the last year, so it's not even a full year yet, in the last year, has generated 60 years of products. 
without some of this 3D technology uh, that they've been able to use. And their responses to RFIs for products and you know spot products, et cetera, that's up like 50 or 60 percent compared to. Uh, it, I think they're satisfying 50 to 60 percent of them when they used to average you know, like 10 percent because these are really hard. So foundational digital twin really important that you know if you are an aircraft or if you're a UAV technology or wherever you are on the globe that there's going to be a layer that you can tap into. At this rate, we believe that by the end of 2025, there should be a mesh of at least two meter variety uh, for the world. Uh, that's a high bar to set, but given the acceleration we're seeing right now, we like where we stand. So NRO and NGA have collaborated for, for years on space overhead architecture, and now Space Force is a component of that as well. Can you talk about the relationship between the three organizations? Sure. What the benefit is of having those three organizations? Because don't, yes. I don't think everyone understands the different components and disciplines that each bring to the table, and then the opportunities to improve that support. It's so true. Uh, I'll start with NRO. And I've said this with Dr. Scalise when he visits with us and he goes through our briefings, and, you know, I, and, I, and I mean it publicly and, I'm, and just like I did privately. There is no organization with which NGA uh, has a closer relationship than NRO. It is, a symbi it is literally a symbiotic relationship. They can't get their mission done without us as an office and, and, and a world-class acquisition office. We can't get our mission done as world-class exploitation and dissemination without them. It's as simple as that. And so there are some other things that, uh, that I'll mention when I start talking about the Space Force that also involve NRO. And so it's kind of symbiotic between all of us. I really like the progress that we've made in our relationship with the United States Space Force really over the last six months or so. I mentioned recently in another forum, it's been sort of like uh, kind of a couple of months of Eurekas uh, where the symbiotic relationship is becoming very clear. I like to think that it might be because of a, uh, an initiative that we launched called the Joint Mission Management Center, JMMC. Because we've had similar episodes in the past. So what's going on here is that DOD is buying its own constellation. And that's going to bring a tremendous amount of opportunity in the TPED process. So for those of you who aren't familiar, tasking, processing, exploitation, dissemination. We're talking about the T here. This is all about the T. And things can get emotional about the T because if you don't task it, it's not going to get exploited, right? And so it matters to combatant commanders especially and to anybody who cares about mission. So in the T, when you're going to have a constellation growing like that, and especially with DOD entities, we're a combat support agency. We care a lot about that. We want to make sure we're complete. You've got to have a place for people to sit, look at each other, discuss priorities, set thresholds, and then use really good technology. And we've got some good technology that combines opportunities with requirements. And these have literally been tested in some recent experiments, uh, or uh, not even experiments, they were true-fledged exercises at Indopaycom, where you look at international opportunities, you look at commercial opportunities, you look at this new DOD constellation opportunities, and you look at your traditional national technical means, and you know the entire list of opportunities compared to the entire list of requirements, and you can check them off. The idea here gets into stewardship, right? Mm -hmm. Because as Americans, we're not interested in paying twice for the same point on the earth at the same point in time. And so this Joint Mission Management Center uh, started as a great idea by our source director that we've been literally putting out there for comments and you know a, a complete concept of operations that you know we're really excited about. And I sense the same from the US Space Force because they helped us with it. This is, a, this is something we collaborated on. NRO will be there, all the services, the COCOMs are all invited. And of course, you know, since our people work at this every single night, they're called collection orchestrators, you know, combining the puzzle that is the weather and orbits and maintenance and priorities, which you know, certainly we, we uh, were just talking about. There's a place on the earth that does that. And we went IOC with this because we just simply, we took the same space where our people existed and do this for a living. And then we created desks and, there, and we already have NRO and we already have Space Force in that building. I'm sorry, in that, uh, in that space of our building here in, uh, in NGA uh, Washington. 
And it's exciting. And the part that I don't talk as much about, but the reason we went IOC is because we actually wired it for sound for one of our allies. Because there's some investment there as well. I don't specify which one. That's not needed. But just know that you know, when you're looking at international, DOD, commercial, and national technical means, there's a place where that stuff can accumulate and people can talk about it. And that's the JMMC. On commercial, and I know we're going to get into this, but the relationship that we have with NRO and the relationship that we have with the U.S. Space Force is also very important. Uh, I, if I could buy the pixels, I would, but my lot in life, uh, and I'm saying our really, NGA lot in life is to buy analysis, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the U.S. Space Force has this thing called TAC-SRT, and both the U.S. Space Force and NGA have determined we're going to be in lockstep on how the TAC-SRT and our analytics and NROs bought pixels uh, all keep tabs on, you know, basically the needs versus the shots, okay, so that we're not shooting the same place on the earth and wasting taxpayer money. And uh, I think that uh, when you look at the whole of government approach here, uh, you know, we represent a really powerful microcosm, uh, you know, as, uh, as your question suggests. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Stacy Dixon was here yesterday, and one of the questions I asked her was cultural policy changes in the IC. What is what has she observed as her time as PDD and I, and and her role in the IC throughout her career? And she mentioned commercial imagery mm -hmm. uh, and how that really correct, created a mindset shift, mind shift change as well as a policy change. Can you can you talk about NGA's role in commercial space going into the future, especially with the growing number of sensors in the sky? Yes, um, and I gave you a little primer on this, um, and it, it involves analytics. And this is where, for a group like this, and this is such an important team, um, I need to just articulate a few dollars, okay, because dollars count, and, um, and as stewards uh, of those dollars, I'm going to go ahead and make sure you know they're being spent well. So our lot in life is to uh, contract for commercial analytics, and it's been a very, very busy year. Uh, people may be aware of what's called LUNO A and B. These are commercial analytics largely driven by some of the requirements that I received from the former Indo-PACOM chief on some aspects of maritime domain awareness and to ensure that we had best of breed commercial analytics applying there. And LUNO A and B collectively, it's $500 million. LUNO A is an IDIQ for about 290 uh, with 10 vendors. Okay, so spreading the load out there, getting the best that we have from the American commercial industry. Uh, Luna B is expected to be awarded in 2025. Another exciting thing, and this goes, this is where I'm gonna tie uh, commercial with AI, is uh, a request for proposal that we made in September, you may have seen this, for $700 million for data labeling. I would love for our people to have the time of the day to do all the data labeling needed for AI and machine learning, essentially for machine learning. And we talked about that process before. But that's actually an additional requirement on our people's time. So we need to pay for it. We're working towards the end where we won't. But for now, uh, we have to pay. $700 million, that is a request for proposal called Sequoia. So again, the commercial sector for us uh, is such an important teammate. And I just want to underscore that. And then the kind of the question of why is this important? When you get right down to mission and combining availability of commercial with your traditional NTM and what DOD is building, now I used to have a mentor who told me, I just want it all. And that's true. Mm -hmm. So coverage counts. Resolution, of course, counts, but coverage counts as well. And secondly, Commercial brings the ability to tell the tale in forums where you weren't able to tell the tale before. Ukraine is a great example of this. So there are over 400,000 users of a portal called GEGD, and that's a commercial portal that allows vetted members of that community to reach and get commercial data, commercial imagery immediately. There's no middle person who says, you're going to see that or you're not going to see this. No, that doesn't happen. If it's a commercial image and it's part of GGD, that means the Ukrainians will get it. 
Now, I'm not going to fall prey to some sort of insinuation that that helped the Kursk initiative. I've heard this before. No, I'm going to cite exactly what the deputy of CIA said, that Kursk was a surprise. But in allowing Ukraine to defend themselves, make no mistake that that portal and the availability of commercial imagery, the availability to talk about it, as opposed to some of our exquisite methods, that's been very, very powerful. So we ended yesterday with Dr. Dixon and General Henry talking a lot about integration and efforts around the community, which is the definition in an engineering sense of integration is interrelated components working together towards a common objective. Part of testing that relationship is through exercises. Yes. So in our last minute or so here, can you talk about NGA's role in Global Thunder? Oh, yeah. Great way to finish, especially here at US Stratcom. And I just had a great meeting with members of the STRATCOM staff, culminating with uh, General Cotton yesterday. And we promoted one of our seniors, actually, uh, to, uh, to a really important post as he leads our NGA team here. So this is a strategic and, in some cases, a field exercise that tests all of the elements of, US, of what U.S. STRATCOM is all about. And it's very, I think it's appropriate for us, given that we're embedded in all of the combatant commands, and this is testing almost every one of the plans that at least are integrated into the Unified Command uh, Plan. Um, it, it tests our ability to do targeting, it tests our ability to do warning, it tests our ability to do uh, uh, safety of navigation on a global level. Mm -hmm. And so we have people who are at strategic levels with COCOMs and especially with General Cotton and his command element, and then we've got people who are out with the trigger pullers and out with those fielded forces. And to finish, it addresses something where we really cut our teeth, and that is strategic warning of some sort of vertical escalation. When I mention warning and I talk about baselining and saying this is anomalous, this is something you need to worry about, make no mistake, every single day when we have an ops and intel update, it begins with the chances of vertical escalation. It always begins in that nuclear realm. And I hope Americans feel better about that, that they've got, again, everything's going to be all right if you've got NGA on your side looking to ensure that you're not going to have some sort of vertical escalation, which, of course, is something we all want to avoid. This is the essence of deterrence, is knowing that you might have a problem. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And thanks for joining us today. I, I think it highlights, especially within NGA, the role of technology and how that not only supports the mission that your agency does and really the entire IC and DOD, but it, it is the mission these days. So thank you so much for joining us today. With teammates like DIA and the commercial sector, we can do no wrong. Thank yeah, you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Don't worry about a thing Cause every little thing is gonna be alright And you don't worry Thank you, Vice Admiral Whitworth and Mr. Casa for that wonderful discussion. Next, we'll have a CIO panel featuring the chief information officers from across the intelligence community and Department of Defense. The panel will be moderated by the acting deputy intelligence community chief information officer, Mr. Michael Castelli. Please welcome the panel to the stage. Going up to the spirit in the sky. It's where I'm gonna go when I die. To rest, I'm gonna go to the place that's the best. All right. Wow. Oh, this is so hot. Good morning. Thank you, Captain, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining us this early in the morning. As you can see, we have a really great panel here today, um, so we're going to, um, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be with these folks. Um, it's an honor to be with all of our partners from across the IC, DOD, and the Five Eyes, and of course, the public sector. Mm -hmm. um, with this panel, I think we're going to get a broad perspective of their thoughts on a few different things, and we'll kind of reach them back to what things you heard yesterday and, and the Admiral said this morning, right? For instance, how does the IC work with the private sector, I'm sorry, with um, state and local authorities for national disasters, right? And how does that relate to the mission? Um, how do we secure the IT infrastructure, right? As, as, as um, the Senator mentioned yesterday, we're under constant threat. So how do we work towards, you know, um, combating that threat? 
And then um, things that Dr. Merritt mentioned yesterday, how do we ensure that the workforce is prepared, positioned to succeed uh, as we move forward? So before we get started with the questions, I'm just gonna ask the panel if they would just introduce themselves and what their position is uh, and which organization they're in. This way, when they're speaking, we, know, we, we can understand their perspective. Doug? Doug Casa, DIA CIO. Uh, Mark Chatelain, NGA CIO. Sue Dorr, ODNI CIO. Uh, Ryan Klotz, the Deputy CIO at CIA. Jennifer Crone from NSA. I'm here under a bit of false pretenses. <laughs> I was originally invited to be on the panel when I was the Deputy CIO at NSA, but I've since moved over to the CFO side. Uh, good morning, Ben Davis, the CIO for Treasury's Office of Intelligence and Analysis. Good morning, Roger Greenwell. I'm the CIO for DISA. So good morning. So Jimmy Hall, and the CIO for the Intelligence and Research Bureau and State Department, plus uh, Director of Technology and Innovation. So as you can see, we have a broad perspective from DOD, the IC. Uh, so this is going to be great. I'm really looking forward. And even now, a little bit of the CFO. So we'll, maybe we'll hear how, how many plays into things. So this morning, the, the, the Admiral and yesterday, Brigadier McBaron, uh, McBaron mentioned um, how the intelligence community, how the infrastructure, how the community helps the state and locals and their national and to response of national, natural disasters. Um, so that got me thinking, right? Similarly, we have the same issues here, and the Admiral made it very clear, right? We have natu natural disasters here, um, the recent hurricanes, forest fires in the past. So um, I'd like to start with uh, Mark and Doug. Um, how is it that your agencies help support that, that kind of response as it, from the national security perspective and, and, and working with, with your uh, organizations? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, NGA has a unique position. Um, when requested and when tasked, as our Admiral mentioned, uh, we respond. We help out FEMA associated with responding to uh, any kind of natural disasters uh, pretty much around the world. Uh, NGA's products, such as our IC or our intelligence community GIS portal, as well as our map of the world, are highly effective in supporting disaster relief in pushing that information as requested out to the furthest reaches within the, um, within the United States, with the FEMA and any other organization, state and local governments that are requesting the information. The ICGIS portal actually provides a hurricane tracker that uh, first responders can use to understand where the hurricane is going to come into. It's a little bit more, much higher fidelity than the one you actually see on AccuWeather or on some of the newscasts so that the first responders can actually target exactly where to respond. We also manage uh, tidal, uh, tidal levels and things like that so that the um, first responders can know where those tidal surges are actually going to happen. Uh, again, Map of the World helps disaster responders create custom maps that they can actually use to, to generate where they're going to be going to actually do search and rescue and to do uh, response and uh, disaster cleanup as well. Um, for Hurricane Helene as well as Hurricane Melton, NGA worked very closely with uh, FEMA and uh, as well as local authorities to be able to understand uh, where people are. Uh, again, uh, Admiral Whitworth ca uh, captured it very well. We actually actually provided some um, uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles to actually go into these areas at FEMA's request in order to be able to go where no first responder could go to determine is there somebody in that car that fell down that cliff? Is a bridge out? Uh, can we actually reach these points? So those are some of the ways that NGA responds to some of those disasters. Uh, and then to answer the question from a DIA perspective, really in two ways. One, of course, is through JWIX, so providing top secret connectivity under any scenario, whether that um, is natural disasters or anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think the most recent hurricane was an example of that, of the coop functions that we had the support of relocating intelligence operations centers and continuing to provide that connectivity. The second way is actually in partnership with NGA. So we jointly run the common operating environment. And so it's not just providing the network comms, it's providing the desktop environment that users log into to do their day-to-day -day jobs. So that's voice, video, and then data. And operating that common operating function uh, is something that we do in partnership, but also a requirement for any COOP scenario that we support across the com combatant commands or any other senior leader um, through flyway kits, as an example, mm -hmm. uh, that we support across the IC and DOD. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now shift to a little bit more of a traditional role of um, how the CIOs work with their partners, the CISOs, for instance, with regard to cybersecurity. Um, I'm going to uh, direct the question to Doug and Mark, but of course, with this question and all others, 
generally invite everyone to just kind of chime in and you know can riff off each other and make it a little bit more of a conversation. I think. Um, so, so Doug and, and Mark, um, where do you see the IC and DoD uh, working to address, uh, working together to address this constant cybersecurity threat? Right, it's, it's constant. So, how are we doing working together? So I'll just start with that. Uh, Please. Two ways. One, uh, in partnership with ODI, and I, we run the Security Coordination Center. So this SCC is responsible for communicating cyber threats, but then also the patching and the mitigations towards those cyber threats. So that is one certainly big area where we're helping integrate the community. The second, uh, which is what we recently stood up over the past couple of years as part of JWIC's modernization, are cybersecurity inspections. And this is a partnership with DOD, specifically JFHQ Doden, um, but then also other IC elements such as NSA, uh, to where we look at the health of the cybersecurity environment that agencies are connecting to JWICs. That goes through everything from uh, as deep as red teaming to looking at just the current state of infrastructure of end of life, whether it's patched and stigged, et cetera, and providing a risk assessment based on those findings. And then the opportunity to identify what are the advancements we need to make in cybersecurity health. That's done directly in partnership with DOD uh, through DOD CIO as, and as I mentioned, JFHQ Doden. Thanks, Mark. Um, from an NGA standpoint, our cybersecurity operations cell or CSOC uh, produces frequent uh, cyber threat alerts. It actually transmits this information on a daily basis uh, across the community, like Doug mentioned. Uh, we share these with the DOD and IC communities for situational awareness and coordinated uh, countermeasure implementation. If you see something, you have to say something. So we have got to get this information out so we collectively as a community can begin to respond to whatever the threat may be. Uh, again, some of our products have highlighted scanning and exploitation of uh, attempts against our vulnerabilities within our networks. As soon as you know about these things, you need to share that information so that you can begin to fix it. Uh, again, it's, it's a collective action to defend our critical infrastructure. And again, if we know something that's going on, we have to be there. We also need to be able to take advantage of uh, the knowledge of emerging trends. As we, as a community, see things that are going to happen, we have to be able to be aware of those things so we can develop some of the countermeasures mm -hmm. associated with addressing those issues. Some of the way that NGA is furthering our ability to respond to these cyber threats is we provide joint training for our workforce so that they can begin to understand the criticality associated with uh, uh, cybersecurity and cyber protection of our networks. We're also implementing a zero trust capability within our networks to provide further uh, protections of our networks. Again, if you assume that the network has been compromised, you're in a much better position to be able to detect threats than if you just think everything's going to be okay as far as the network goes. And Thanks. from the NSA perspective, the Zero Trust journey is one that we've been on for quite a long time. NSA has two missions, SIGINT and cybersecurity. We produce and collect SIGINT and we ensure cybersecurity for not only NSA itself, but for all national security systems, whether they're owned and operated by the government or contractors, whatever classification level, whether they're in or out of the IC or DOD, if it touches national security, it's the responsibility of the NSA director in his capacity as national manager for national security systems. And then, of course, we have within NSA the responsibility for securing our own enterprise and networks. So when we think about uh, cybersecurity at NSA, we're thinking about from those both of those perspectives. So when I think about the things that worry me the most, I think about the fact that to get anywhere in cybersecurity requires constant, constant vigilance and continuous investment. Um, it can't be something that, yeah, we took care of that last year. You're never done. You're never good enough. What you thought was good enough today is not going to be good enough and tomorrow. And what you do today is going to have ramifications for not only yourself, but for other agencies going forward. And if you do a terrific job, if you succeed beyond all expectations, the result is that nothing happens. Uh, and then you get up in the morning and you have to do it again. So this worries me for a number of reasons. Um, the political cycle is sometimes fickle. People want to know what's the cool new thing. What are we doing this year? No, cybersecurity was last year. It, we can't do that. We need the moment you take your eye off the ball, you lose focus. You open up a, a possible area of vulnerability or risk, and then a risk to one is a risk to all. At NSA, uh, internally to ourselves, we had as 
as much as we had worked on cybersecurity, it's been part of what we've done for 70 years, uh, back before it was even called cybersecurity, it was called information assurance or communication security. Um, even though that was all in place, uh, we had a bit of a wake-up call about 11 years ago. There were some um, undisclosed, uh, unauthorized disclosures. You may have heard about it. Um, so as a result of that, <laughs> Uh, NSA had to take a, a good hard look at ourselves and made a tremendous investment, not only in funding and moving a lot of money over, but also in people. We took some of our very best folks at NSA, some of whom were working the, the sexy mission operational things and said, we need to lock down on, on our cybersecurity. And we implemented secure the enterprise, secure the network, which are essentially what we talk about as zero trust today. Mm -hmm. So I know what it took for us to do that, having watched it from uh, different roles and now from within NSA. The enormous um, intensity and the uh, investment and the continuous focus year after year. And that was just to get us to what we think is good enough. So one of the things that really worries me is how can we keep up that focus? How can we keep up that level of investment? Now that I'm on the CFO side, I see how much is competing for the same resources mm -hmm. and knowing how we're going to have to be able to make sure that we make room for that. And then I think about it was that hard for NSA and security is literally our middle name. This is what we're, this is one of our primary missions. It's something that's a top priority. And we had this huge wake up call. How much harder is it for other agencies? And it's wonderful, we're, we're all partners, we all work together, that's what DOTUS and JWIX is all about, but it also means that we're only as strong as our weakest link. So that's why NSA invests so much in not only continually upping our own game, but sharing that with our partners, not only on the stage, but in the audience. Um, we have within, so our, our CISO and our team within works really closely with the rest of the IC and DOD to share our best practices, our lessons learned, our maturity models so that we can all, a rising tide uh, lifts all boats. And then also through our cybersecurity division, we do tremendous outreach and we've established such a high level of partnership across the defense industrial base, issuing guidance and direction and issuing warnings and um, uh, threat intelligence. And then in some cases, actually providing NSA services free of charge to um, industry because uh, the good thing is, we're, the bad thing is we're all in this together. A risk to one is a risk to all, but the good thing is we're all in this together. And um, since a lot of what I know about cybersecurity, I learned from Sue Dorr, um, I'll see if she has any comments. Um, so I'm gonna take it from the perspective of a small IC element. Um, it is a team sport, the value that us working together and see something, say something, the SCC as a, one of the seven f federal cyber centers is profound. And we have to remember that, that there, there should be no ego in this game. We have to make the phone calls, we have to look for the signatures, we have to go to the patch servers, we don't build our own, we need to go to the places, and so the humans can work on the hardest things we have instead of reinventing. So for a small IC element, it's this partnership, it's this community that makes 100% of the difference. So Mike, uh, just yep. capitalizing on from the State Department's perspective, uh, when Sue talked about a small uh, State Department is a small for sure, but I also like to, and I've heard the senior leaders in State Department say this, and it's important for me to just note, you know, uh, d diplomacy is our business, right? And so clicking on those links uh, is something that we must do, right? State Department is in 270 locations, 190 countries, 150 languages. And so we don't have the luxury of not communicating with our, our diplomatic partners, right? And so when you talk about cybersecurity, it is important for us to see something, say something, but it's also important for me partnering with the folks on the stage, but also for you all to understand that the very dynamic of our, our business is diplomacy and clicking on those links. And so we're only as weak as our, uh, we're only as strong as our weakest link for sure, but understanding our dynamic and our landscape will help us continue to protect uh, our environment. We, we too had our own um, espionage case in State Department. So we, we too are struggling with things that we would think are easy. We've learned, and I'll be honest with you, part of what we've learned is just to follow our own processes, right? There are SOPs in place, and there are standards in place that we need to follow. And so just from my seat in the State Department as Intel CIO, is that cybersecurity is important for what we do. Just to add to that, I think, you know, it's important to recognize this is not an IC problem. This is a whole of government problem. And so, again, when you look at, you know, the interaction, you know, with the fact of, everybody that's up here representing IC, DOD, State Department, et cetera. 
we all have to work together and we're facing a lot of the same challenges. You know, Doug talked a lot about the JSIP inspections and the work that goes on with the Department of Defense, you know, Joint Force Headquarters uh, Information Network. Um, you know, there's a strong partnership there in terms of what DOD, you know, drives responsibility for and what the IC drives responsibility for. And again, everything is a really, it has to be about a partnership. When we think about a lot of the, you know, controls that get put in place with various programs, whether it's NIAP or, you know, that's ran by NSA or, you know, the fact that the Department of Defense publishes security technical implementation guides. All of this is driven around a partnership between our organizations to make sure that every capability we put in place is, is secure to the extent that it needs to be. And security isn't always equal between all the systems. You know, when we recognize the investment that we're going to make in certain national security systems to protect that data may be different than the investment that we may place on, you know, certain other systems. So again, it's truly a partnership in recognizing how some of those differences come into play and what type of controls that need to be put into play. And again, sharing information amongst all of us. Yeah, I think I'm excited about where the community has gone um, from a zero trust steering committee perspective, developing a common understanding, a baseline of, of a basic maturity model for zero trust. It allows us to uh, commonly evaluate where we are on the various pillars of zero trust and then target investments to, to enhance the maturity across that. I think at CIA, we focus on not only implementation of zero trust, but in the online and active systems that we have, how do we operationalize cyber defense? I think that cybersecurity has long been a compliance action and activity, and it's still necessary to ensure that sort of day one, the necessary security controls are implemented appropriately, and that is through assessment and sort of the compliance effort. But once online, how do I operationalize cybersecurity? How do I make it real time? How do I collect and evaluate the telemetry that I collect off of systems um, to allow our cyber defenders to quickly take action to find the needles uh, of anomalous behavior behavior uh, in that sort of vast amount of data that we collect on systems um, using modern technologies, AI and machine learning in particular, to sort of model what is normal and then act when it's abnormal. Uh, we've really um, put a lot of effort in sort of operationalizing cybersecurity, again, sort of that shift from a compliance-focused activity to one that is uh, an operational imperative. And the, the only thing I would add, as a, now a CIO of a small and a former director of the ICSEC, is I wholeheartedly agree with everything that was stated on the stage. Um, you know, as we, we need to continue to sew the seams to make sure we're, we're sharing um, relevant tactical cyber threat intelligence and information at the speed of mission. So, you know, as you share with, with CISA and, you know, CISA shares with JFHQ Doden and the ICSEC, and we need to make sure we bring in another element of this, and that's our international partners. So as I was walking out of the door of the ICSEC, we had a lot of focus and attention on making sure that we could share um, at the speed of mission with our 5i partners. So I hopefully will continue to uh, grease the skids there and make sure that happens. Great. Thank you very much. That's great. Great interaction. I love it. Now, so I'm going to keep on this uh, cybersecurity theme, but I'm also going to change the focus a little bit. Um, yesterday, um, some of the folks were up here talking, kind of directly talked to, to, to the, part, the private sector partners out there, right, using this, this as, a, as, a, uh, as a telephone to say how we can, how we can use them to help us, right? Or how they, um, so I'd like to know, what, and I'm going to ask this for Jennifer, Sue, and Roger, right? Um, how do you see the cyber threat evolving, right? That's what's facing us. How is that evolving? And then how can we use the private sector solutions to address those evolving threats? So we'll start with Roger, if that's okay. So I, I think if, you know, again, we look at the challenges that we're facing, you know, in the DOD world, I think, you know, a couple of things come to mind. We could probably all sit up here and talk the rest of the afternoon on some of this that's going on in the cyber world. But, you know, to me, there's the element of risk management and authorization. Somebody yesterday mentioned about, you know, the challenges with the ATO process and being able to uh, work through those processes. And then, you know, Ryan mentioned the whole element of cyber defense. And really, when you think about it, from my perspective, it's how do we actually get those two elements actually working together? As we think about, you know, the, the risk management processes and making sure that the systems are actually built securely up front, designed securely, um, our 
the cyber defenses actually in play? Are we ensuring that the relevant data uh, that needs to come from those systems is feeding in to our cyber defenders? Is that data moving at real time? Uh, I will tell you, you know, we, we've had some lessons learned in DISA very recently, things that we know we need to make improvements on. And so sometimes you realize, you think that you've gone through, you've done all of the, the efforts that you need to do to secure data and you find out, well, somebody made a change somewhere in the environment and things don't necessarily operate the way that you would expect them to. So how do we, again, put those controls in place that actually help us to be able to recognize that a change occurred in the environment and give us that true continuous monitoring, not just from the patching of a system or a configuration vulnerability, but actually as it relates to our ability to monitor, defend, all of the different systems. Again, we're faced with numerous challenges, whether that's you know an external adversary or an insider threat. Uh, again, recognizing how are we pulling that data in, getting it to the right people at the right speed, at the right time, that the data is good. Uh, you know, yesterday General Henry talked, you know, about the principles of Vaultus, and again, making sure that as we think about that cyber defense data, does everyone actually uh, follow to that principle, and are we making sure again the data is getting to the hands of our cyber defenders? And again, factoring that into the risk decision process. So again, it's really a fundamental change, I think, in how we uh, look at where we're going from a cybersecurity perspective. The other piece, of course, is zero trust. And again, zero trust is uh, a very important initiative, and I think this is gonna really have a, a major effect also on the way that we do cyber defense, because we recognize that we're moving from you know, more network-centric defenses to data-centric defenses. How do we actually train and ensure that our cyber defenders have those skills that are necessary in order to protect uh, all of our information systems? And again, the other thing we have to realize, we cannot people our way out of this. I've mentioned this at conferences before. The volume of data that we are all faced with we can't just add people to look at this. We have to drive you know, uh, AI and ML to actually help uh, analyze that information and actually enable us to make faster decisions. It's not necessarily to take the human out of the loop, but enable the human to make a much better, more informed decision and take advantage of automated responses where we can. So those are some of the big challenges that I'm seeing on the horizon. Great, thank you. Something you said sounds very much like a conversation we were just having at breakfast about how a lot of what we're doing on cybersecurity and really across everything we do doesn't scale manually. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to look at AI ML. I was actually remembering something Robert Cardillo had said at, um, I think it may have been GEO and Symposium, where he said, if we just scaled how we used to look at imagery, um, we would need 8 million new analysts. And so maybe we need to look at a different way of doing it in the same way with cybersecurity. We were talking about tech debt and how so much of our systems are still, and our um, sensors, everything is still done manually and we're not going to be able to scale that because uh, Michael, you had asked about um, emerging trends and then how we can partner with the, what we need from the private sector. Emerging trends, I don't know if it's emerging, but it's a continuing trend. Uh, the cybersecurity uh, challenge is going to get more complex and more expensive every day. And uh, funding is not going up uh, commensurately, so we have to find smarter ways of doing more. Um, of course, quantum resistant cryptography is something that uh, we're increasingly aware that uh, there could be a clock ticking somewhere. And then one of the things I wanted to highlight is that as we in the government are shifting more to cloud and to hardware and platform as a service, the security uh, profile and pro the security risk becomes even more of a shared responsibility between government and industry because it's we, we need to think about exactly who has responsibility for which layers, ensuring that we all are on the same page and that everything is meeting the same standards. And that requires a whole nother level of, of trust and partnership. And that's going to be really critical moving forward. 
If I could add to what you said, Jennifer, on finding more efficient ways to figure out how to achieve what we need to do, um, there's been more planning, joint planning between the IC and DOD. Uh, JWCC and C2E is an mm -hmm. example of that, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. But that does also require a mindset shift on both sides to where, just as an example, Roger, you know, you guys are, are the executive agents for Nippernet, right? So on the unclassified side, you're traditionally worried about the external actors and the threats that those pose. And then, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, in the IC and NSA, insider threats is, is a big challenge for us, right? And that's where we've placed emphasis. And the reality is it's not more one than the other, it's both. We have, to, we have to put equal emphasis on both internally and externally to those cyber threats. Sure. So I wanna just kind of riff off of some of the others. So we'll do Can't Human Our Way Out. That was at that same G1 conference. <laughs> Secure by design. Was Secure by design. Yeah. Um, so FedRAMP is just a starting point. So for industry, um, as I've walked the floor, there'll be the I'm FedRAMP and I'm like, and then what? Um, you have to also recognize you're gonna need to figure out how to work in a disconnected cloud. So if the thought is that we're going to be doing something in, on, on a classified network and we're gonna be calling out to your commercial cloud something somewhere, that's not what our architecture is. Um, so please, please, please be aware. Now, if it's your own class stuff, we can have that conversation about where that partnership is, but you know, FedRAMP is the starting point disconnected cloud, um, so make sure you understand kind of what the expectations are for your customer base as well. Um, this is one I'm gonna probably toss back over to Jennifer, but it's the recognition that with this partnership of industry, you're seeing worldwide threats at the scale of private industry. We expect the um, response at the, at the pace, but we also need to understand a degree of sharing of that information when you see something and we need to understand it to help protect mm -hmm. our disconnected cloud space and that interaction. So it's that private public partnership and understanding the state of cyber. So I know NSA does that a lot more. I just watch it from the outside and really hope that it's going very, very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the as a small, it's the usage of the enterprise contracts that allowed us to bring to speed for our cybersecurity activities. That's profound. But please, please, please remember, if you see something, say something to us too. Yeah, it's a two-way conversation. <laughs> Great, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. So um, keeping with the theme of partnering with uh, the private sector, we just talked about how they can help us in cybersecurity. And more generally, if I could... Uh, switch to um, Jimmy, Jennifer, and Ben, right? Um, how can we partner with the private sector to help them address the technology gaps that we might be seeing? How can we work on that partnership? I think we'll start with Ben, if that's sure. okay. Um, as I was rethinking this question last night after yesterday's session, I kept coming back to a statement that ended, ended the 5i panel yesterday where it was said, you know, partnerships are a way of life. I mean, I think you've heard that through the, you know, the early discussions here. I think that is wholeheartedly true for the Department of Treasury and specifically OIA. I think we do it really well on the mission side, you know, from the cybersecurity side. I think we don't do it as well as we should from a from a CIO engagement with industry perspective. So it's definitely a growth area and a priority focus area for FY25, for Treasury specifically. Um, I think I do it well here, um, but I'm too small and the threats are too high and the risk is too high for me not to expand on that partnership at pace with you all in the audience. Um, so, so how can you help? I think the first thing is I need transformational partners, not transactional partners. So understand my environment, understand the limitations of my environment, where I am, where I'm going. Um, help me get there quickly. Um, I, I essentially operate in, your, in a nearly 200 year old building. It comes with some challenges inside that building that are unique to me that may not be present across the, the stage up here. So so come come in and help me um, be a, be a um, a change agent and a, um, something that helps me maximize my solutions at pace. Um, the, the second thing is, you know, I need the right solutions at the right time. 
my, my staff is small, we're focused down and in, help me be the up and out and help me look over the horizon and make sure I'm looking at the right technologies. And it may not be your technology, but help me look to where I need to be to get the right solution in place on time. Um, I think I would be a little um, remiss if I also said that part of that, the first step of that is on me. We need to outreach and engage with you more. Um, we have a targeted effort inside Treasury right now to make sure that we adopt some of the methods that my partners here on the stage have at their disposal to partner with you quickly with academia to, to test solutions, get them in the door and, and get them deployed at pace instead of relying on a burdensome acquisition process that can take years to get solutions. The, the rate of technological change just isn't sufficient for that anymore. And then last but not least, um, we're here. My team's here. Um, we have needs. We want to chat. So please grab us. Please, please start that partnership now. I don't want to leave Omaha without, without meeting with you and making sure that you are helping me tackle my most pressing needs. Thanks, Ben. Jimmy? Yeah, yeah, sure. So just, just to uh, follow up on what Ben said, but, but before I do that, let me just talk a little bit about INR. So we, we've been proudly uh, providing intelligence support to State Department for 79 years, right? And that's all source intelligence. And so our mission is pretty simple, uh, to provide the timely and objective intelligence to support the secretary, support senior policymakers, and also diplomats. And that's a global uh, outreach and global mission aspect. And then as CIO of INR, um, I just oversee the TSSCI network globally for the department. And so I can't do that alone. Uh, many of you who met with me know that I, I say that, and I say that honestly, is that we, we can't get it done alone. Uh, my colleagues up here would, would agree. Uh, and so uh, I think we'll start first with our resource aug augmentation. We're doing that today. And so we've agreed to outsource some aspects of our work, and that's going to continue. Um, in fact, uh, I have a couple of contracts in place now that are just extension of my staff, and it works well. I mean, the only difference between uh, a government and a contract is the color of badge, their badges, and so it works. Uh, secondly, the training and development piece, right, and, and helping with um, th those training opportunities sometimes that we don't take advantage of, that you are all are aware of. And I, and I know from an industry perspective, you offer the expertise and the innovation that we need. And so continue to bring that to the table and continue to engage with us. And then uh, lastly, I, I would like to see more uh, a cross partnership where we either do training exercises together or we take advantage of your labs uh, or your facilities that you have that are skipped out that we can uh, partner and train and develop and, and, and walk this dog together. And so from a partnership perspective, again, we can't get it done alone. Uh, I try and have uh, several industry engagement meetings a month and that's working out well. And so if you're on my, my list, uh, be patient uh, and I'll get to you, so thanks. Thanks, From a DISL perspective, you know, industry is such a key partner with everything that we do. Again, we can't do it alone either. In fact, one of the things that DISL does every year is what's referred to as our forecast to industry, which happened to actually occur just yesterday uh, back at near the Fort Meade, uh, where we bring together all of our, you know, senior leaders, minus myself, who's out here with you all, uh, but bring together most of our senior leaders, a lot of our program managers to actually meet with industry to talk about what are our upcoming needs? What are the areas that we're looking for opportunities? Uh, there are opportunities for industry to be able to support us. And then, of course, you know, again, that interaction with our partners in play, you know, they're working with us today. We always have to figure out more. You know, our adversaries are evolving, our threats are changing, the landscape is changing. So how are we actually having those dialogues so that those things that you're supporting us on today, we're actually conversing and recognizing what those changes are, what we may need to change from a government perspective, what we may need you as a provider to actually change in a system. And sometimes it seems like we, we don't always communicate that way. You know, we get very focused in terms of, well, the scope of the contract says this. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's valid, but we also need to be able to make sure we're having those open conversations about threats so that if we need to change our contracts, or we need to change our relationship. We have to make sure that our systems and our capabilities are continuing to evolve. So that's a two-way partnership that we really need to work better with industry on from my perspective. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll, I'll jump in oh. if you don't mind. Go yeah. for it. Um, I, yeah, I, 
I think I would offer kind of a response in, in sort of three ways. I think for the systems integrator community, um, we need and in fact demand sort of diversity of solutions that you present to us. In the context of cloud, for example, we have been on a journey uh, as noted yesterday for 10 years uh, with one provider. We now have access to four on the high side. Uh, we need sort of diversity of solutions taking advantage of the investments that we're making in this multi-cloud uh, world as an example. Uh, for the technology service providers, um, we need a relationship and partnership beyond uh, the point of sale. Uh, what we find is that we we, we identify a, a need, mm -hmm. we fill a gap with a technology, and two years later we've 10% implemented and we're not optimized, we're not taking advantage of, of the investments made, and then we're ripping and replacing and almost starting over. So like engagement and partnership beyond the point of sale is super critical so that we can fully optimize and leverage the tools and technologies that are uh, implemented across our networks. And third, it's really a call to arms for our government employees here uh, in the room to hold the vendors accountable, um, to hold them accountable for offering the diverse solutions uh, that we need to solve uh, new and unique and emerging problems. The things that got us here are not necessarily the things that will get us there. Uh, challenging the status quo, uh, many of us rely on these vendors uh, within our, um, our infrastructures um, uh, to support key uh, activities. Uh, but at the same time, they have a financial interest in maintaining status quo, and we need to be bold enough to challenge it when necessary uh, and disrupt when appropriate um, to deliver those new technologies that we need to solve kind of tomorrow's problems. Yeah, actually, I'd like to make a, a sure, few please. points on that note. Um, one, in, in terms of working with industry, as you know, as CIOs, we offer enterprise services, such mm -hmm. as cross-domain, identity management, et cetera, where it, it hurts us in our collaboration, not only within our own agency and across the community, is when we replicate those services within our mission elements. I see that a lot. I, I see us standing up redundant capabilities and not leverage it leveraging the enterprise vehicles that we've put in place. That's where we really need your help, is that, that partnership. Um, we've, we've certainly grown in that area, but it's also an opportunity um, that we need to focus on. Second, where I've seen a, a lot of help from industry in the past year is helping us solve our acquisition problem of looking at where can we take opportunities of leveraging enterprise licensing. ICCIO has been a, a, a great partner in this and helping lead that across the IC. Um, but then also DISA has as well, in terms of identifying acquisition vehicles that we could take advantage of to get after our priorities uh, without releasing our own contracts, right? Things that are already within scope that are open to us that we could take advantage of. A lot of that is recommended by industry, and so I'd continue to emphasize that. Thank you. Um, Ryan, you just started to mention uh, cloud, so I'd like to shift to that a little bit, right? Um, great potential. Right, it's a, it's a wonderful tool if we can take advantage of it. H how do you see that being utilized in action, the, the community using? Yeah, thanks Mike. Uh, I have great fortune of um, jumping on that train in 2014 as it was leaving the station. Um, I think people see where cloud is today and don't recognize um, how hard it was to get here. Um, uh, in the early days, uh, credit to NGA was first in, I think with Map of the World, if I recall correctly, soon mm -hmm. after uh, a launch in 2014. Um, I think we viewed cloud as data center replacement, right? Infrastructure as a service. I have got, you know, hardware or virtual machines in my data center, I move them to cloud, sort of didn't refactor. It was just sort of a lift and shift. I think. What we've seen is a great maturity, uh, not only within government, but within our vendor community as well, to figure out ways to help us take advantage of the opportunity of this, um, this perceived uh, infinite capacity, um, the access to um, you know, a variety of IT services, democratizing access to infrastructure uh, and services, and we've seen it grow to a point we said, you know what, I think we've done a lot of the digital transformation work as a community, and now we're ready to sort of uh, take the next step into sort of this multi-cloud. So in 2020, we awarded the Commercial Cloud Enterprise, or C2E, uh, with five vendors, four that uh, now operate within the top secret network fabric. Um, we're super excited to see um, uh, the evolution uh, to come. Uh, our imperative is to deliver the multi-cloud foundation to allow the community uh, to take advantage of those higher order services, whether they're AI, 
uh, services natively provided by those vendors or third party or open source um, to have the compute capacity to run those models to, to, to do inference on like cybersecurity data as we talked about, but a variety of other sort of mission imperatives. Um, but also the, broad, the access to the broader ecosystems of technologies that have natively been grown in the cloud environment. Uh, if you're a startup, um, the last thing you'll ever do is, is, is acquire a data center and buy some servers, right? You start in the cloud, you natively built those capabilities in the cloud, you build a business model around consumption that is, that is metered uh, based on utilization. Uh, those are the things that we think we can now uh, gain access to by delivering this multi-cloud foundation. So I think where we started, um, and, and I think great work been done over the last you know, 10 years or so, I think the opportunity is even greater now um, through our partnerships with these, uh, these great vendors, um, but then to access the broader ecosystem of solutions, um, uh, you know, to put those in the hands of our, our various mission problems, our, our partners to solve kind of those unique problems. Great, thank you. Ryan, your, your reference to 2014 takes me back. I'm in the way back machine thinking yeah. back to you. I remember Sue Gordon saying NGA was all in on the cloud. Mm -hmm. And I remember having to assure people that going to the cloud didn't mean things were going to be on the open internet. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it we is. You shouldn't have called it commercial cloud. That, yeah, was, that was one of our first fail. mistakes. Marketing yes. fail. Yeah. <laughs> Same for us with IC Gov Cloud, which was not in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it took me way back, and um, it made me also appreciate how far we've come. And this year, especially from the NSA perspective, is really monumental in our, in our shift. It's a, a once-in-a-generation change in how we, um, how we build and how we deploy our IT. Because historically, our default has been we build it in-house and we deploy it on-prem, and that's how we do our IT. And starting, the journey started about 10 years ago, um, but what it's about for NSA, and I know for many of my colleagues here, it's all about finding the right compute solution for each mission, the right option for every distinct problem and for every distinct uh, purpose. So that might be commercial cloud, it could be C2E, it could be an NSA instance of a TS cloud, it could be hardware as a service for things that don't quite work on commercial cloud, it could be on-prem. There's a whole range of options and so we've kind of evolved from saying, no, we can't do cloud, that's, that's too open to everything out on the cloud to really having a discernment as to what missions and what purposes should go into which, which platform. And that's been all about how we partner with industry. How do we leverage the best that industry as a whole and that individual companies have to offer so that we can save the human capital for the things that truly only government can do. And that is not building data centers. Um, that is not something that we have the, the corner on the market on. So that's what our hybrid compute initiative is all about. And uh, it's exciting because this is the first year at DOTUS I can talk about HCI is, is real. Um, at multiple DOTUSes, DODI, is that the plural <laughs> yeah, of, of DOTUS? Yeah, yeah, DODI. At multiple DODI, <laughs> I have talked about a hybrid compute initiative in the future of these amazing partnerships that NSA had for with industry for commercial cloud on the TS side um, for NSA, as well as hardware as a service. And this year it went live and we are deploying mission with our partner, and that's our core mission and services, our IC, our inaptly named IC Gov Cloud, um, which provides hundreds of programs mm -hmm. and uh, systems that are used not only by NSA, but across the IC and DOD. And uh, sort of like what I said with cybersecurity, when we switched it over, nothing happened. And that was wonderful news. Um, of course, the long-term reasons why we made this shift is the increased reliability, increased performance, ultimate scalability and modularity, the efficiency. So so there was no way we could get where we needed to go in SIGINT and cyber without those partnerships. So it's a really exciting time to be at NSA as our, our hybrid compute initiative goes live. And it's not only about mission systems, we're also looking at those partnerships and using uh, various uh, cloud service providers and other providers for our business systems. Uh, we talk a lot about um, innovation and we tend to talk about in terms of mission, but we need to have innovation in our business systems as well to keep up. When you talk to folks about their long poles in the tent, a lot of the time it's budget, it's the IT, it's some of those underlying things that, you know, it, it's, it's how, how much trouble did we have with our RTAs to, in order to, to fly out here, right? Um, so those are some of the things that we're focusing on, um, but it's a, 
it's a milestone year for us, and it's been a, a long journey with uh, many of us on the stage wearing different hats over those 10 years. I'd say we're all, DISA is also in that same perspective, Jennifer, as we think about, you know, again, it's not just about, I'll call it the commercial cloud offerings, but things that we're, you know, trying to take advantage of with like our joint operational edge where we're actually deploying small clouds out closer to the edge where again, our warfighters are essentially working around the world or in some cases more on-prem offerings or again, taking advantage of commercial cloud capabilities at all classifications, uh, things that we're doing through the JWCC program. I think one of the things I'm most proud of is actually the work that DOD and the IC are doing together as we think about how we actually assess the risk and, and look at, you know, again, how we take advantage of the cloud and working with industry. Um, you know, the cloud works portfolio that's, that Ryan is involved with, um, you know, they are really taking the lead with the top secret platforms with DOD in support of that. And we're looking for DOD to take more of the leadership role when it comes to the secret cloud. But, you know, what we're really trying to do is do what I would call good government, right? We don't want to go through and have to actually, well, let's go have one team assess this and then another team assess that same cloud. How do we actually work cooperatively, understand those shared risks, and then be able to make the risk decisions that are appropriate for each of us, right? You know, the DOD's risk tolerance is going to be a little bit different than the IC's risk tolerance in certain cases, and, and that's okay. The biggest thing is we're trying to create those efficiencies and that shared knowledge by bringing, again, the power of the two teams. I think the other thing that we're trying to do in commercial cloud especially in the classified areas, you know, was recognized yesterday, we don't fight wars alone. We, we depend upon our Five Eyes partners. We depend upon other coalition partners. How do we, you know, look to take advantage of those capabilities that, you know, commercial cloud at all classifications offer us? And how can we actually enable that true war fighting mission with our Five Eyes partners, et cetera? Uh, things like collaboration. It was mentioned yesterday that you know we are faced with challenges in the collaboration space with our Five Eyes partners. So again, there's a lot of initiatives that we have underway working again very closely between DOD and the IC in order to improve the capabilities for our warfighters. So. Mark? So again, thank you for the uh, recognition that NGA jumped into mm -hmm. the cloud first. Um, we are a real risk adverse organization and that was a real risky thing to be doing, but uh, it has paid off. Um, moving our instances to the cloud, uh, our former deputy director, Sue Gordon, said everything will go into the cloud. You will be there by 2017. Uh, we quickly found out that that really wasn't the right thing to do. Some workloads just don't operate well for our mission of warning, safety, and targeting uh, in the cloud. So we had to pull some things and leave them in our on-premises data centers. Uh, we eventually found out, though, that uh, even our on-premises data centers wouldn't handle delivering capabilities to our warfighters. So we have established something called our Joint Regional Edge Nodes, which pushes data, pushes applications out to the edge where analysts sitting at the edge, warfighters sitting at the edge, can actually access this information. So it truly is, like you mentioned, Jennifer, that hybrid situation where you've got things at the edge, you've got things in our data center, you've got things in the cloud, you've got things in multiple clouds. And so um, I'm glad we're able to learn from each other. Thank you. Mark and Doug, yesterday, Dr. Merritt was talking about the IC roadmap, and one of the things she talked about was priming the workforce and making sure the workforce is ready for the future. So my question for you is, um, how, are, how are your agencies working to ensure that the IT workforce is remaining current? So how are you keeping your, your folks current so they can, can you to continue to excel and advance the mission? Sure. Um, I could just start with that. Uh, so really two ways we've emphasized <coughs> in the past year in particular. One, um, we've opened up um, or implemented STEM pay, right? So this has not just been unique to DIA. This has been all the agencies uh, across the IC and DOD. Part of that 
is upskilling the workforce for the qualifications to qualify for STEM pay in certain positions mm -hmm. that they might be filling that uh, they don't have the, the necessary certifications. So we have uh, expanded uh, an online training portal, which actually was, was not that much of a cost, um, but did expand course offerings to the entire IT career field within DIA. And surprisingly, it has increased um, not only obviously the qualifications, but the diversification of how many courses and disciplines uh, individuals within the IT career field are getting engaged in. Our training went up within the past year by 4,000%, which is crazy to think, uh, at a very cheap cost. And that's important to us uh, mainly because as you look at our own workforce engagement survey, w what I find, especially in the comments, is, is that those that are most satisfied in their roles and engaged are the ones that are continuously learning. And, and I've done surveys in the past um, where I've led the analytics of that, and that has been the trend. Of everyone wants training and everyone wants to feel engaged, and those two elements are tightly coupled. Uh, so that's been a big success for us. The second is how we provide opportunities, not just for joint duty assignments within agencies, but also with industry. So we run what's known as Education with Industry, EWI, um, within our IT career field, providing JDA credit to those that are embedded within our uh, industry partners. That's been a big success, not only in terms of understanding business practices and how we can uh, become more efficient in the way we operate, but also the implementation of tools that we have already purchased. Um, oftentimes, we take advantage of only one small element capability of uh, whether it's application or infrastructure that we've integrated within our enterprise um, and haven't realized the full potential of it. And by embedding our workforce in with industry, we've, we've really gotten a holistic picture of what we can do with what we have more efficiently. Doug, I have the exact same situation um, with our employee climate survey. The people who respond to that survey indicate that training is actually one of the most important things. Uh, pay, not so much. Uh, uh, workplace, location, things like that, not so much. It's that training. The ability for people to better themselves, not only for the short term, but actually for the long term. Either in upskilling them to be qualified for different types of positions in our organization, or actually learn additional skills to better themselves within their location. It creates that sense of belonging within our agency, and that creates that job satisfaction. So it's not all about just training our existing workforce, but also we are looking to bring in new and um, exciting talent into our organization. So coupled with training our existing workforce, looking for that new capability or new technology uh, mindset coming into our organization, that is what basically uplifts our workforce from an education standpoint. Great, thank you. Um, similarly to the training and keeping folks current, the other thing is accessibility, right? We wanna make sure that the workforce can actually has access to the tools and can optimize their ability to do their jobs and to support the mission. So um, Jennifer, I think I'll start with you, if that's okay. I would ask, um, what are some of the key strategic initiatives uh, at your agency that you have in place to advance I, um, I, uh, IT accessibility? Thanks so much. IT accessibility is a top priority for NSA, and I know for many of my colleagues up here. It is a true priority, it is mission. The same way Roger had referred to secure by design, we need all of our capabilities to be accessible by design. Uh, so section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, which requires federal services and systems to be accessible to individuals with disabilities, has a national security exemption. We could, under the law, just say, it's national security, it doesn't need to be accessible. NSA determined years ago that that was not good enough for us. And it's not just about what's the right thing to do, it's about the fact that in the, the battle for talent, we were just talking about workforce, we can't afford to say there's a sizable proportion of our employees or potential employees who won't be able to fully participate and fully contribute because we have failed to make everything accessible to them. And so it's a question of not only the right thing to do and of being right for the people who work for us, but also of mission criticality 
reality. So NSA said, we're going to create a policy that says we have to be accessible. It's the, the assumption is every system should be and program should be accessible for individuals with disabilities. So we put in place the policy, we put in place standards, we have a score sheet, we created a PMO, which I was really proud to have as part of the deputy CIO position. Um, and this was all very uh, thoughtful and nuanced and laid out exactly what the expectations were and what it was that it would require in order to, in some cases, it really isn't uh, possible or practicable to make something accessible, but nine times out of 10, we can get there. So what I really wanted to emphasize in response to your question is what made the difference. So having the policy and the standards and the scorecard and the PMO and the maturity model, that's all necessary but not sufficient. What I feel like has really made the difference at NSA is leadership and partnership. Uh, leadership, it's all about our leadership and especially our CIO saying, this is no kidding a priority. This is not something that you do if you have money left over after mission. This is our mission. Um, also at breakfast this morning, we were talking about the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. And uh, in a way, it is like that, the speed limit on the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. When you have a policy, yes, we're aware that it exists and that notionally there's a rule, but if there's nobody there telling you it's important and enforcing it, people are con gonna continue to go 110 miles per hour, sometimes in the shoulder. So it was really important, despite having all of the policies and standards in place, to have someone saying, yeah, no kidding, this isn't just a paper exercise. You can have the slide in your required program management review deck, but unless the person who's reviewing says, no, stop here, I wanna ask you some questions and why you haven't made progress on this. It's just going to be another reporting exercise. So that's made a huge difference from the top on down, having leadership say, this is important, this is mission cr critical, and this is about our workforce. And another aspect that's been really important is approaching it a partnership. It's a partnership among the advocates, the program management office, the program managers and developers within the agency, as well as with industry, um, to make sure we're all trying to get to the same place. Um, and it's really difficult. It's not, so I talked about the importance of having it be prioritized by our leadership, but that's not the only obstacle. It's not just, oh, if only everyone understood, it would be easy to make everything accessible. There are major challenges. Um, sometimes, uh, for example, a lot of developers, they didn't learn how to build accessibility and it wasn't part of the curriculum. So one of the things that our program manager office did working with our uh, university is to start offering um, services and, and training to developers so they understand how to build it in from the beginning. That's made a huge difference. Um, and then approaching this as a, a partnership and how can we all get there together? Sometimes there are serious technical issues. Sometimes it simply doesn't make sense. If you have um, a system that's on a remote mountaintop somewhere, maybe it's not worth not deploying it until we can make it fully accessible to everybody. But we have cl clear standards and expectations for what it takes to meet those criteria. And then sometimes, so we really struggled with trying to find um, a way to do multi-factor authentication in a SCIF that is accessible for people with visual disabilities. So it takes everybody working together, the folks on the acquisition side, the folks on uh, the industry side, our advocates and the program managers, and that's made the, the real difference. Um, and that's why it's been so important to us, and that's how we've tried to, to make a real difference. And we're not good enough, but I'm really proud of how far NSA's come. Yeah. Michael, I'd like to talk about the GW Parkway um, because there are, a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of barriers on that, both man-made and natural, that slow traffic down. Um, in some cases, that's good because there are uh, areas that are under construction that go into one lane. It would be very dangerous to go to 110 miles an hour, but others are quite frustrating. And I think that relates to 508 because in a <laughs> sense, what gets graded gets done, right? So we have thrown up some barriers um, to aid in the accessibility of technology and support reasonable accommodations. One of those is contracts. So we now evaluate every contract that we put out in DIA under the standards of Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, that is an opportunity for industry as well, even though you know, the contract may not specify it, um, <laughs> making sure that you're helping in that area. That helps, obviously, 
um, our workforce at the end of the day. And the second is, and, and we did this a couple years ago with, with ICCIO, is actually grading, holding ourselves accountable, like we do for analytic integrity and standards, where agencies are evaluated on how effective they are on tradecraft. We've done the same in 508 at the community level, and in DIA, we're continuing to do that. We do audits, inspections uh, of ourselves, especially our websites, and how uh, accessible those are to the, the community that we provide reasonable accommodations for. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. And, you know, in that sense, those, those barriers are helpful, but also to Jennifer's point of lifting some of those barriers, changing the policies uh, to make things easier for our employees in the workforce. Um, uh, in addition to what Doug and uh, Jennifer has talked about, um, when I was the associate CIO several years ago, I started to basically get involved with our accessibility programs and, and realizing that an acce accessibility required uh, someone when they came into our agency to fill out a reasonable accommodation and 45 to 60 days later they might have something that would enable them to do their job. They're wasting two months worth of time just sitting there not able to do their job because the systems are not accessible. So we started a policy and it is our policy that everybody is able to perform on day one. We understand what special needs might be, but again, most of our systems are accessible across the board and we create them that way from day one. So that's something that we have got to do. Another quick story is that um, I was part of our deaf and hard of hearing uh, advisory uh, group, uh, taking care of our deaf and hard of hearing folks. Um, I, l I learned the term see with deaf eyes. Uh, basically what you do is you see things differently if you don't have that hearing sense. Uh, most of our deaf and hard of hearing uh, individuals work at a skiff. They don't have the ability to phone home, to receive messages from home like you and I do sitting in our offices. They don't have the ability to call their doctor and talk about a serious medical condition without going through an interpreter. And I don't think any here, anybody here wants to share that information with somebody that is somewhat of a stranger. So what we've done is we've actually created and we got policy changes made to implement uh, uh, basically unclassified video phones for our deaf and hard of hearing uh, community at our agency. So within the SCIF we actually have cameras, which is almost unheard of, to be able to allow these individuals to be able to contact loved ones, to contact their physicians, and be able to use uh, American Sign Language or some other type of means of communication. And so again, it's important that we take care of everybody within our mm -hmm. organization. And all of our agencies, I think, are learning from each other on this. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you had had that experience. I'm a, one of the senior champions for the deaf and hard of hearing I see affinity network and so we've been learning from each other all of the agencies in terms of the pilots we've done um, for especially for the the deaf and hard of hearing and I did want to point out one area where we made great progress as an IC this year was a medical device policy a um, huge issue for the deaf and hard of hearing and, and also for folks with pacemakers and other problems is that every agency had its own criteria for what you were allowed to bring into a skiff and with um, uh, hearing aids, it's very, very difficult these days to get one that is not Bluetooth enabled, that is not um, basically uh, internet of things. Um, and so it was uh, really difficult, even if someone was just going to a meeting in another building, to have to figure out, am I going to be able to attend? Am I going to be able to hear? Do I have to use a suboptimal solution in order to be there? And uh, the IC, came together and wrote a policy to try to standardize expectations and standards for medical devices, including but not limited to hearing aids across the IC. And as someone who wears hearing aids, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think this was a, I enjoyed the conversation, watching you all kind of riff off each other and kind of expand on the thoughts. I th hopefully that was as enlightening for the audience as it was for me. Um, but before we uh, walk off in here, I think we hear the walk-off music uh, again. Um, I just would like to turn uh, the podium or the microphone over to Sue Dorr, if I could. Thank you so much. Um, so as I sit here with my partners and peers, and, and I say my family in the audience, um, this is my last CIO panel. I'll be retiring in February. Um, so I have been blessed in, uh, to be able to come back up one more time. Um, but it really is a, a homecoming to me to, to watch my, um, um, all my people I worked with over the... Welcome back from the break. 
Our next speaker is Lieutenant General Hensley. Lieutenant General Hensley, a man of many hats, currently serves as the commander of the 16th Air Force, commander of Air Force's Cyber, and the commander of Joint Force Headquarters Cyber at Joint Base San Antonio, Lackland, Texas. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Hensley. Hey, so uh, what an honor and privilege it is to be able to speak uh, to this crowd today. Uh, I got to admit, so when I was asked to come up with a walk-up song, I put absolutely zero thought into it. And I was like, hey, just let's play the Aggie War hymn. Certainly there's a bunch of Aggies that, were, uh, that are out there that would appreciate that. Uh, but then yesterday and today, you know, all these other previous speakers are getting up and saying, this is the reason why I picked the song for my walk-up song. And I'm like, man, I suck. I didn't put that much thought into it, but uh, then I was told that last year John Sherman used the Aggie War hymn, so I was like, good. If John Sherman did that, then I'm, I'm in good footing. Hey, so I just wanted to say again, thanks so much. It's an honor and privilege to be here. And just over the past couple of days, I've bumped into a number of old friends and faces that I hadn't seen in years. And one of them was a fellow second lieutenant at Aviano Air Base, uh, my very, very first assignment. And so seeing all these familiar faces, it's, it's fantastic. So for those folks that know me, I go by crypto. For those folks that don't me, know me, I go by crypto. <laughs> uh, so for the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, 16th Air Force, AF Cyber, our view of great power competition. Uh, but uh, if, if we can go to the next slide, I, I think what I'd like to do is just sort of give you a little bit of context about 16th Air Force, because it's more than AF Cyber. Uh, and giving you this context, maybe it'll help uh, provide a little per perspective of sort of where I'm coming from uh, with, you know, the things that are on my mind, the things that we're working on from a 16th Air Force standpoint. I do have some slides for you to take a look at as I go through the presentation uh, to help better explain you know, what it is that we do. And just give you a little bit of background on 16th Air Force. We just recently crossed our fifth uh, anniversary of being in an existence. So in 2019, our senior Air Force leaders they pulled together 24th Air Force, AFT, Cyber, 25th Air Force. Uh, that's the numbered Air Force that oversaw our ISR and EW Enterprises. We pulled the weather wing in there, America's weather wing into that. The uh, wing commander is here right now. And we created the first and only information warfare NAF uh, within the Air Force. And so when you think about the convergence of capabilities and authorities, uh, we, we sort of put it into three different bins. So there's an enabling bin where intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance provides indications and warnings, provides battle space awareness. Certainly, weather drives behavior. It drives our behavior. It drives adversaries' behavior. There are things that uh, we can do in our planning to help use the weather to obfuscate what we're doing. So from a, an enabling standpoint, we've got intelligence and we've got weather. The second bin that we look at uh, from our command is uh, the non-kinetic effects that we can produce in the cyber domain and in the electromagnetic spectrum. And then the final bin are the authorities, the authorities for strategic communication, IO, MISO, MILDEC, especially when we're working with our different uh, combatant commands. And so I'll, I'll briefly go through, You've got, we've got 10 wings, uh, we got the Air Force Technical Application Center. They're responsible for doing the global surveillance and nuclear treaty monitoring. The next wing is the 70th ISR wing. So they're America's cryptologic wing. They're embedded with NSA on a global scale. The 363rd ISR wing, they are predominantly our deliberate targeting wing. Uh, they also do foundational intelligence, uh, and they also provide SIGINT support to soft operations. The next wing that you see is the 480th ISR wing. Uh, they do regional support to the regional combat commanders with multi-source intelligence, processing, exploitation, dissemination, being able to provide time-dominant uh, type targeting and battle space awareness. And then we have our flying wings. We have the 9th Reconnaissance Wing out of Beale Air Force Base. Uh, they fly the high-altitude U-2. Uh, we have the 319th Reconnaissance Wing out of Ground Forks. 
Uh, they fly the medium altitude RQ-4 Block 40. The 55th wing flies a multitude of aircraft. Uh, the RJ, uh, from a SIGINT standpoint, uh, they have compass call from an electronic tech standpoint. Uh, there's other aircraft that they fly. But a lot of people, when they think of 16th Air Force, they think of the cyber stuff that, that we do. And that's only a part of it. And so the final two shields that you see are the 67th Cyber Wing. And when you think of the 67th Cyber Wing, think of offensive cyber operations. And when you think of the 688th Cyber Wing, that's right, the, the first Cyber Wing, right? That's right, the first one. And well, I, I can't say that. <laughs> but uh, when, when you think of the 688th Cyber Wing, think of network operations. And I'm gonna talk about that here in a little bit. And you know, some of the things that uh, Senator Fisher brought up, General Cotton brought up, uh, Congressman Bacon, I'm gonna echo a lot of the things that they talked about, uh, specifically from a cybersecurity standpoint. Uh, we also have the uh, total force shields that you see below those. And when you look at the total force of our command, we've got about 49,000 personnel at 123 locations worldwide doing information warfare in support of our air components. So if we can go to the next slide. So sort of thinking about the strategic environment, and again, here's where I will echo some of the things that the speakers before me have, have highlighted. So I got a news flash for you. From a strategic uh, environment standpoint, China's important. I think everybody understands that. And so uh, the Secretary of the Air Force is his number one priority is China. His number two priority is China. And his number three priority is China. China, China, China. And uh, so uh, my PA folks, they really, uh, they, they're like get antsy when I start throwing out dates, but other people have thrown out the date already, so I'm just gonna build off of their comments. So 2027 is a date that uh, we believe that the Chinese wanna be militarily ready to defeat the United States in a regional conflict. I put air quotes around regional conflict because I'll address that later. And uh, so, you know, when I think of 2027, I think of it's almost 2025. And what we talk about in 16th Air Force, and I'm sure everybody else does too, is the shot clock is ticking, right? There needs to be a sense of urgency to do the things that we need to do to create the ecosystem and the architecture uh, to be able to be prepared for a possible conflict with China. It's not inevitable. They haven't come out and said that this is the day, the year they want to do it, but it is a planning date that we are back planning towards so that we can be prepared. And as General Cotton talked about, so you no, know, with China, we, they're referred to as the uh, pacing challenge and Russia is the acute threat. And uh, as something that General Cotton talked about yesterday, they're not so acute of a threat. They're more of a persistent chronic threat that uh, we have actually been dealing with for the past several years. When you think about all the stuff that they've done going back to 2014 till now, and the constant reminders uh, by President Putin himself that they have nuclear weapons and uh, the aggressive nature by which they continue to try to make progress in the Ukraine, there's always a concern that there's a miscalculation, there's an escalation, and the next thing you know, we might be in this 2027 Russia escalation, multi-theater war kind of scenario. Um, so as we look at you know, the worst case, hope for the best, plan for the worst, how do we set the theaters? How do we set the globe with collection, processing, dissemination to be able to prepare for you know, that, that possibility? Uh, the accelerated change. And so I think we're all tracking these accelerated changes. So we've got you know, hypersonic glide vehicles that uh, can strike with precision. We've got uh, swarm drone capabilities that we see in great effect in, uh, in a multitude of conflicts. AI ML is being developed, quantum computing is being developed. And so staying on top of all that to the best of our ability to integrate that into our war making capabilities is a priority. Uh, contested environments. And so I'll squat here for a little bit and just focus on that. And what I'll say is uh, I think we all know that the Chinese have developed anti-axis area denial capabilities. In other terms, it's called the long range kill chain that they've developed We'll talk about that more here in the, in the presentation later. 
But what have we been doing over the past 30 years, right? The global war on terrorism. And so we have done, we've created an ecosystem where we could basically go after a bad guy on a motorcycle in the middle of a desert in uncontested airspace in a permissive environment. I'm not making light of you know, what we did over the past 20 or 30 years to get after the global war on terrorism. But when you think about the ecosystem that we have built to be able to do that mission, that ecosystem doesn't scale well against a nation with modern military capabilities in large quantities. So that's the problem set that we're trying to attack. And as they are continuing to develop their long range kill chain ecosystem, we are developing our long range kill chain ecosystem. And the question is who can develop it the quickest? Who can develop it to be more robust? Who can develop it to be more resilient compared to the, uh, the other side? And then finally, we have the ascending domains. I won't talk to, too much about this, but uh, I think we all know that we have our adversaries that are looking at space capabilities and cyber capabilities. And what we've been saying is, if not us, who? If not now, when? So if 2027 is the planning assumption that we're looking at, and it's 2025, we're not going to miraculously get uh, outcomes and products and capabilities in 26 with the trained people to be able to do those. That's just not going to just show up on our doorsteps, right? So the solutions that we need for a possible situation in 27, if not us, who? It's us, if not now, when? And it's now, right? So it's all of us, and it's right now, trying to find solutions so that we can get to a better state. Next slide, please. So when we start think, you know, talking about China, we talk about long range kill chains, we talk about kinetics, we talk about conflict scenarios. And in reality, I think uh, this crowd understands it better than most is they're developing cyber capabilities to target us today, right? So when we look at it in terms of competition, crisis and conflict, competition, steady state, activities below the threshold of armed conflict, things are happening in the cyber domain. So I just want to spend a little bit of time on this slide to like tease some of these things out. And again, some of these will resonate because uh, they'll echo some of the, you know, the thoughts and comments that my predecessors talked about. But when you start in the lower left hand corner, uh, mis and disinformation, you know, that happens all the time. Uh, it's more prevalent right now as we get ready to, to go to the election booths and, and uh, you know, vote for you know, our, our presidential candidates. Uh, so, but you know, our adversaries, not just the Chinese, but in general, they know those polarizing topics within our society. And so they use the cyber domain in different ways to just stir up those polarizing topics. And you've probably heard about them, you know, the hack and leak, uh, virtual personas, social media, automated bots. And with the intent of, you know, undermining uh, the legitimacy of our government leaders, our government institutions, our government processes. And you heard it yesterday, uh, you know, the Chinese have uh, a vision, a goal of being the global preeminent superpower. And that starts with eroding the legitimacy of the US government, democracy, and the West. So if we then turn our attention to the uh, next uh, picture, you know, we have the F-22 and a Chinese fighter that looks strangely familiar looks strangely similar to that F-22. So the point here is that over the past several years, the Chinese have used the cyber domain to steal a staggering amount of intellectual proprietary information. Designs, plans, schematics. And because they've been able to do that, uh, they've been able to make a generational leap in military technology without putting the sweat equity that's involved in coming up with the plot plans, designs, schematics, doing it at a lower, lower cost because they, they already have the plans, designs, and schematics. And then when you add to the fact that they have a strong economy and what have they been doing? They're just cranking out these uh, modern military capabilities in large quantity. And when you think about, what is it, like 80 miles separating China from Taiwan, 89 miles? And so it, for those that have seen like various threat briefs out there, you see like this big, large red blob 
that China has and a smaller blue blob uh, with uh, U.S. and allies and partners. So they know that uh, studying us for the past 30 years, it's force generation, it's power projection. And so for the Chinese, quantity is a quality all in its own. So if we turn our attention to the top left-hand uh, picture, ransomware. Who hasn't experienced some sort of ransomware attack? Uh, so government agencies have experienced ransomware attacks, uh, schools, hospital services, airlines. You know, for a while it wasn't really a national security concern until Colonial Pipeline. When Colonial Pipeline suffered the ransomware attack and then we had a shortage of gas and diesel fuel for five days in the southeastern portion of the United States, hey, this ransomware attack, uh, that, that is a national security concern. What are we going to do about that? And then move it over to the top right. So usually I ask a crowd who has heard of Volt Typhoon, and usually about 25% of the people raise their hand. Well, you know, Senator Fisher yesterday, she talked about Volt Typhoon and Salt Typhoon yesterday, so I'm sure everybody would raise their hand if I asked that question. But that's a key point where, like, the general populace doesn't know about Volt Typhoon, much less a large portion of our DOD military people don't know about Volt Typhoon. And for those folks that weren't here or maybe still don't know about Volt Typhoon, you know, according to the FBI Director Ray, uh, Volt Typhoon is an advanced persistent threat, an AKA a malicious cyber actor that is sponsored by the Chinese government. They have had persistent access into our critical infrastructure and key resources uh, for the past several years. And so when you think about that, uh, they have access to water, energy, transportation, all of which have no military value. And so when you think about that, why ha do they have persistent access into these networks? The assumption is that they're planning to do some sort of destructive cyber attack if there's a regional conflict in the Pacific over Taiwan. So you, you may have heard it, maybe you didn't catch it, but when the senator was talking about total war, so it's not total war in the sense of like World War I or World War II, but think of producing destructive cyber attacks against those networks with the intent and purpose to create panic and chaos with our American population, that really is total war in the 21st century using the cyber domain. Uh, so if we can go, uh, looking at the next uh, chart, CrowdStrike. So if you recall a few weeks ago, there was a day where, you know, most of the airlines across the globe and some banking institutions, they were down for the better part of a day. And nothing, I'm not trying to disparage CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike is a company that uh, was trying to provide cybersecurity uh, to, to the networks. And they made a mistake, but as a result of this mistake, 8.5 million uh, Microsoft uh, computers went down, as did all these airlines and these banking institutions across the globe. And that was just a mistake. Uh, I think the only airline that was flying at the time was Southwest Airlines, and that's because they're still using Commodore 64s uh, with their networks. <laughs> I love Southwest Airlines, so if there's like Southwest Airlines folks out there, I love them, they're, they're the best. So when you, when you like carry that string of logic, right, with all the things that they're doing with espionage, with intelligence, probably preparing for some sort of cyber attack if there's a situation that dictates that, that brings us to the last uh, uh, picture in the lower right-hand corner. So that's just pick, a, pick an air base. And if we think they're not trying to get access to our air bases, uh, we're naive. So they are trying to get access to our air bases. And as I mentioned before, they've studied us for the past 30 years. They know that we generate forces, project power. And when you think of, from an air standpoint, our, our five uh, mission functions, it's air superiority, it's uh, global strike, rapid global mobility, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, C2 and battle management. Those are our five functions. That's what we're asked to do and do it better than anybody else in the entire world from an Air Force standpoint. 
What do all of those functions rely on? A network. So for every single line and block chart for all of those different functions on how we do that, there is a lightning bolt with networks. And uh, Jen was earlier during the panel, she was talking about, you know, the tech debt that uh, we all are struggling with. Uh, so what we are trying to do as an Air Force is make sure that our networks are not the soft underbelly to our war fighting capability. And so what do we need to do? So we, first, we need to do the terrain analysis. We need to understand our own ecosystem. Do that mission ready terrain cyber analysis so that we can figure out the key terrain. Buying sensors to, to cover everything in our ecosystem is cost prohibitive. So where is the key terrain that we need to put the sensors to protect the data to go where it needs to go? And so that's precision sensor employment. But you gotta understand the terrain uh, to begin with. Uh, there was also some talk oh, about the sensors though. You know, it's, it's got to be enterprise sensors. It, it can't be some cowboy county option where sensors are developed, but only, it's only localized. The folks that are trying to protect these networks, you got to have access to the log data so that we can do the continuous persistent monitoring of those networks. Um, and, and then uh, from the respect of CSSPs, MDTs, we got to continue to fund those. Uh, and that's from a personnel standpoint. But what was also mentioned during that panel earlier today is that, you know, I like to say we're not going to mass our way out of this. Uh, I think the gentleman uh, from DISA said we're not going to people our way out of this, and we're absolutely not. We're not going to be able to hire a bunch of people to be able to monitor these networks. And so investing in AI, ML, we have about uh, 2.5 million alerts per day. And uh, if you're familiar with the Air Force architecture, we have the Elixir database, big data platform. We've got SIEM and SOAR, high performance computing capabilities that help us bin these, uh, these alerts that come in. But there's still far too much human in the loop activity that's happening. And so when we start censoring weapon systems and C2 systems and SCADA systems and acquisition systems and we're censoring more and more and more, the human being is not gonna be able to keep up with all the data that's coming in. So we have to invest in AI ML to do that content triage metadata analysis so that the human beings can tackle the most important things that only human beings can do, and that's the nuanced analytical thinking and problem solving that we need our humans to do. So AI ML, and probably the, the, one of the big things that we need to continue to do is just practice good cyber hygiene. We still have far too many vulnerabilities that are out there because we're not doing the scanning, we're not doing the patching, we're not doing the things that we need to do to, to keep our network safe. Okay, next slide. So that's from a cyber standpoint, but at the end of the day, we are working on long range kill chains. And no, the United States is not uh, the adversary in this scenario, but uh, we have this exercise that we're doing called Bamboo Eagle. And uh, we do this off the west coast of the United States. It's a joint force exercise. And it's to replicate the long range kill chain that uh, the Chinese are trying to develop. And then how do we fight through that long range kill chain? And so when you think about the Chinese, uh, they've got modern military capabilities. They have modern air surveillance capabilities with KJ-500s, they've got fifth generation fighter aircraft, they've got air to air missiles that can go extremely long ranges, they've got uh, uh, Ren highs and Luyans that uh, on the maritime surface can extend that, that range. But at the end of the day, you still have this thing called the curvature of the earth. So how do, we, how do they get those missiles beyond the curvature of the, alert, the earth, beyond line of sight? And so it's only physics and its capability and it's you know, the use of space and overhead to be able to do that. So when you look at, when you put all that together in the ecosystem that they have, we're talking about hundreds of miles of, uh, of, a, of a weapons engagement zone. So how do we, as a joint force, fight through that long range kill chain? What are the things that we can do from a non-kinetic standpoint, from a kinetic standpoint? And then what can we do as we develop out our long range kill chain so that we can prosecute that fight? 
And so this is an ongoing exercise that we're doing uh, to ensure that we have that jointness uh, because clearly no one surface is gonna be able to you know, pick up this fight on their own. It's gonna be a joint fight. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I mentioned before, 16th Air Force, convergence of capabilities and authorities. Uh, we are the Information Warfare NAF of the United States Air Force. Our intent is to be able to support all of our air components with uh, information capabilities layered into the operations, activities, and investments that they do on any given day, week, month, or year uh, you know, across the globe. So on the chart, you'll see in the top left-hand corner, I sort of talked about those five core functions that we're supporting. And all of those, the foundational piece to that is our network security. In that top center piece, I talked about the three different bins on how we use our authorities and capabilities to do that. And then from a, you know, an IW standpoint, helping our blue forces understand from a blue standpoint, what should we reveal and what should we conceal? You know, we don't wanna show everything, right? because as soon as we start showing everything, then they're gonna start coming up with a countermeasure and you know, we don't necessarily want that. And then from the adversary standpoint, what do we expose and what do we disrupt? And the big uh, dome center there in that picture is basically the process by which we go through on a quarterly basis with the different air components as we assess the prior quarter's activities of operations, activities, and investments did we move the needle from an IW standpoint? Did, did the adversary even recognize what we we're doing? Did we do something that was counterintuitive or counterproductive to deterring China? And then rolling those lessons learned into the next quarter for operations, activities, and investments, how can we improve what we're doing? Uh, so this is a relatively new concept. Uh, we've been at this for less than a year. Uh, it's, uh, we're going through a very crawl, walk, run uh, standpoint. We did our first crawl back in January, uh, and then in June we did a run, or walk, excuse me, and a couple weeks ago we had another walk. Uh, but when we're running, it's uh, quarterly syncs with all of the air components supporting their combat commands as we try to operate in the information environment. And so, I guess we can go to the next slide. What I, what I leave uh, audiences with is you know, if there is a conflict in 2027 or before 2027 or after 2027, we hope, you know, if we do IW right, we don't have a conflict at all. But if we do find ourselves in, in some conflict, you know, we're not going to go to war with the military that we wish we had. We're going to go to war with uh, the military that we got, and we're going to win with what we got. Because at the end of the day, we have an asymmetric advantage over the Chinas and the Russias and the North Koreas and the Iranians. And that asymmetric advantage is you. It's all the innovation, great work, the great thinking, uh, the creativity, the discipline that you put into what you do every single day to make sure that we are as best postured as possible. And so we have that asymmetric advantage and that asymmetric advantage is you. So thank you very much for what you do. I really do appreciate your time and attention. More importantly, I appreciate what you do every single day for the security of our nation. I have a couple of minutes. I'll open it up to any questions, comments, or concerns. Or I'll just stand here and stare at you for two minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, Lieutenant General Hensley, uh, for those remarks. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from the intelligence community Chief Data Officer, Ms. Lori Wade. Ms. Wade was appointed as the IC CDO in May of 2022 and is responsible for leading the IC's strategic initiative to reimagine the future of the IC's data landscape in this digital era. Please welcome Ms. Lori Wade. Oh, 
the dog. Yes, no one's more surprised than I am that I'm back, right? <laughs> yes, and uh, guess what? Uh, I didn't know it, but I'm back and in the Silicon Prairie, right? Thanks, Doug. Thanks for bringing us back here, right? Um, I just want to, uh, yes, thank Doug and um, the DIA team uh, for having me back uh, last year. Had a lot of fun when I came out. Uh, really enjoyed being able to bring the... Uh, focus to data. I want to thank the leaders uh, yesterday and today that were on the stage that talked about data centricity, right? Data interoperability, data management, all the things that we need to do, right, with our data. I felt like a prairie dog in the front row every time it was mentioned. I popped up. I was very excited. Um, so I appreciate that uh, because the work that we have ahead of us, and we just heard it, right? I love that I got to come after uh, the briefing that we just heard. And every one of the mission elements that got up here on this stage uh, in the last day and a half. Also, all of my uh, digital C-suite colleagues that have been up here, the CIO panel, all of us have been talking about the challenges that we have to carry out our mission, right? Uh, the timing, the pacing challenges, everything that we're trying to do. And all of it comes back to the fact that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but I like to talk about is the plumbing, right? We are a data organization, and it's very critical to be able to get the IC where we are today, to be able to go to the art of the possible with AI, to carry out those mission challenges, to meet the pacing challenges. Some people talked about a near-peer adversary. A lot of people talk about the fact it's a strategic competition that we're in, right? So we've got that pacing challenge. And then we have the pacing challenge that's facing us with the uh, emerging technologies. I want it. I want all of it. But to get there from where we are today and where we need to be, we're going to have to do some of that planning that they talked about, right? So part of that planning, and for the U.S. intelligence community, I would argue for everyone, but for the U.S. intelligence community, we need to be able to, advance, to scale advanced analytics to process large and compounding volumes of data for the sole purpose of, do, of having timely, accurate, trusted data for decision making and insights. And we need to do that in this extremely inter, in, interconnected um, digital and evolving environment. So, that's what I want to talk about today is how we're kind of where we are in the story for being able to do what's on this slide up here, architecting for data quality and AI solutions. I think they gave me this. I hope it doesn't blow anything up. I think it's to advance the slide. We'll see. It didn't work. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Um, so last year we talked a lot about we had released the, the National Intelligence Strategy and the IC Data Strategy. These documents address everything that we need to be doing, right, as a, as a collective, as a, an intelligence community. It highlighted a lot of the themes we heard yesterday about partnership, right? This is a team sport. I'm not up here just representing uh, myself in the role that I have. I'm up here representing the 18 element CDOs. And thank you to the uh, heads of the agencies that have elevated that role over the last year. That's a big, big part we have to have is the, to have them at the table to be looking at what we're doing with our data. If we're going to be a data organization and have data interoperability, then you need to have a data professional involved in, and at the table helping to make those decisions throughout the life cycle. I've said that a lot, but now we're actually making that real. Uh, those documents talk about the partnership of the private sector. That's why we're here, right? It's between the public and private. We have to work together. The innovations that we're doing on the government side and the innovations that are happening in the private sector have to come together. We need to bring everything to bear on those challenges that we've seen over the last couple of days. And then I can't uh, get off the stage not without saying hi to my Five Eyes uh, partners who are here. They're very important. Uh, that, that's a big focus. I'll talk about that in a minute, some of the things that we're doing there. So the, those strategic documents can't stand on their own. And I'm not just relying on the fact that we have strategies with our action plans 
for every single one of these documents that we have here in front of us. And we, and we have deliverables. And today I'll be sharing some of those deliverables with you. Uh, ICD 504, you see that on there, an intelligence community directive on data management. Well, I think we can clap for that, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Why is that important? Because that is gonna make it real. Like how are we pushing data management all the way at the point of collection, all the way through uh, dissemination and disposition of our data, right? We, you don't get there without a plan, right? The, the briefing we just saw, they don't get that, uh, you know, all the, the equipment and uh, everything you need to fight a battle, right? A kinetic, uh, without some planning. That just doesn't show up there, right? You have to do some planning behind that. And so getting the behavior that we need to get our data and quality data it, where it needs to be to be able to, to access it and use it to the greatest extent possible and use the technology in a way that will help that do that at speed and scale is very critical. So having a plan for that and having a directive, that's one of the things we're focused on. And already we're uh, putting that uh, into action. We have several memos that we're putting out, intelligence planning guidance. Uh, one of it is to implement the ontology work that I did uh, and the team did with uh, the DOD, the CDAO. Uh, we ended the 15 year uh, ontology wars and we set a common core uh, ontology. That's very important when you start looking at siloed data and automating how we're gonna connect that across uh, a, a, a distributed ecosystem. So that's some of the documents that are coming out of there is how to drive that into each of the agencies, uh, those data management practices that we need. Uh, yesterday, uh, my uh, colleague and uh, co-collaborator on a lot of uh, work that we're doing, uh, talked about the vision for the IC information environment. It's a very important document along with our zero trust uh, architecture work that's happening. In both of those, there's a data centric pillar. We have uh, delivered uh, on one of the, the key milestones for that, I'll talk about that in a minute, is the IC data reference architecture. That's actually one of the actions from the IC data strategy that we said we're gonna deliver this year. And we just signed that last week before we came here today. Uh, all of this is to say, the strategy is in place, we need the vision, but we have to immediately start executing and implementing on those, and that's what we're doing. I'm gonna try it again, let's see. Whoa. Good, okay, this should look familiar. I talked about this last year. A lot of the people talked about uh, TPED, the intelligence cycle, the work we do. This is still the vision. This is what we're trying to create, right? The data-centric experience for everyone that's in that globe, right? So the warfighter, the analyst, the um, data scientists, everyone who's working in the intelligence community needs one thing, right? They need trusted data and they need it. We talked about data flowing freely and securely, right? We need that at speed and scale and we need technology right, the AI to help us to do that. But that doesn't come without thinking about how the plan, right? And so when I came last year, I talked about how we were moving across this through end-to-end -end data management, which we're still doing. Each of the 18 elements have data management uh, plans, templates, they're executing on those. I know uh, some of the agencies are automating how they do that from the point of collection, how they transport, we need to make better decisions, right? In the data management plan, it asks us to think about, before we collect it, what is the actual classification of the data? What is the best transport? Why are we putting the most exquisite transport against every data set when, you know, when really, when it originates, it's unclassified? It doesn't get classified until it kind of goes through, right? Uh, so let's think, let's make some more conscious decisions, right? We have a lot of capability. Everything you see there in the hexagons, I talked about it last year, those are services of common concern. These are, we have a lot of capability that we funded to date, right? We need to adopt those. That's where we're gonna to get to interoperability, right? And then how do we get it over there, right? You see AI, ML all the way across there? It's very important, the art of the possible. How do we apply it? How do we, how do we accelerate being able to operate, collaborate, and communicate anytime, any place, any security domain at speed, scale, and securely. Well, we're gonna to have to be very deliberate about how we're working that, right? I talked about the data management planning last year, this whole process. 
I've come to realize, right, you know, we talk about data as a strategic asset. We're a data organization, I'll say it again. But data is only an asset if we manage it well, right? Otherwise, it's a liability. And we're seeing it's a liability. We've heard it, right? We, I've got the, the zero trust and continuous monitoring around there. Like we just heard, and we've heard yesterday. What do people want from us? They want our data. They're coming after it. They want it. So it becomes, the more we have of it, I like to say more data does not equal better, right? More, more data causes problems, right? Because <laughs> then it becomes a liability, people want it. So there's a cyber risk associated with it. The other thing it takes, right? We know that uh, AI uh, takes a lot of compute and power, right? So then it comes a cost issue. The more you have, the more you have to store, <laughs> the more you have to index, the more you have to com have compute on. So it becomes a, a liability. We already have across the IC, a lot of folks come up to me and tell me like, yeah, we're running out of uh, funds. We'll run out of funds in the next few years on being able to do the compute and storage. Well, that's where I get to the, we talked about the big and little E of enterprise. We've got to get the mission side making better decisions up front about the data as it goes through its life cycle because they just are assuming then that the enterprise is paying to keep all that data, right? So we have to do things um, as we go through this process. Um, I also uh, will point out, you know, when we think about the collection as we go through, or even the acquisition of data, so open source data and commercially available, all of this applies to that as well. Because at the end of the day, all of that data needs to be collected or purchased and acquired with purpose in mind. Otherwise, we're just creating more problems for the rest of the downstream because we haven't planned for it and we don't have the funding and we don't have the plans. We don't have the people that we need to do that work, right? Um, we'll keep this in mind. We'll, we'll continue on as we go. What's next? Oh, my God, my favorite topic. AI at scale. Somebody said yesterday, scales, I think they said it this morning, scale is a problem for us, right? I want everyone to look under your seat. I have left something for you under your seat. AI. I gave you some AI. <laughs> what? No, that's how everybody talks about it, though. They act like it's something we're just going to grab and just throw on it, right? Uh, no. Um, AI is based in, um, you know, it's, it's scientific, right? It's, it's uh, mathematical. It's uh, computer science based, right? These are things that have to be done. You can't do AI without the things that are on this, uh, on this slide here, right? Data, my favorite topic. Uh, enterprise infrastructure and security. A lot of people talked about the fact that a lot of our uh, infrastructure is at end of life, right? We have a lot of legacy. We have a lot of tech debt. We have uh, tooling, right, where we're putting our data that hasn't even been upgraded in 15 years. Ooh. Wow. Uh, we talked about the skilled workforce, right, that you need to be able to do this work. It's very human in the loop right now. I think last year I talked about the swivel chair fat finger. Operations will turn fat finger. That still exists. Uh, we're still trying to attack that, right? But the skilled workforce, because the other thing about AI, right? And a lot of people talk about we could just bring in a large language model from the outside and just make it work, right? A frontier model to the high side, success. No, because that model in the open has not been trained on national security, Intel data in a way that we can use it out of the box like that. We have, to, we have compliance, we have civil liberties and privacy, we have everything we have to do to the data. We have rules and laws about how long we can keep data. All of that has to be tagged and labeled to the data. And right now that's still very manual. And we also have to have prompts. We do have to do the algorithm work. We have to write prompts, so the prompt engineering. And, the, and then that all leads to the compute and power decisions, right? We've got to make conscious decisions. What's the denominator? How much data do we have? What's the data that we actually want to use? So volume plus how fast we need to process it equals the amount of compute we need and power. But the problem is all the conversations I'm in lead us to an AI gold rush, right? We talked about investments. I think someone mentioned the fact that the, you know, the uh, national defense budget is a very small percentage of the GDP. 
Well, you see right there, the AI-related investments could peak as high as 2.5 to 4% of the G GDP. That's actually higher than of what we're doing to support na uh, the national defense budget, right? So you see these numbers. I'm not going to go into this. I just want to share them with you and think about them for a minute. The AI gold rush is like the actual gold rush right now, right? People are running with semiconductors like they're the pickaxe and the shovels, right? And they're going out and we found a resource, you know, chat GPT was released and we think, great, look at all this, right? Well, just like in the actual gold rush, the value of gold as a trading commodity really came about in 1000 BC, right? AI is not new. It's just that we found it as like a resource that could help us with some of the things that we want to do, right? And faster. We're kind of like that right now, right? Except we got people out there and they think, oh, we're just going to send some people out and gather up all the data, throw some AI on it, which doesn't actually happen because to actually get value out of the data and use AI to do it, it needs to be very planned, right? We need to make sure that it's in a form that we're applying all the capabilities that we have, right, to get to something of value that we can get insight out of. And we didn't go from just getting gold out of the ground to gold bars or my gold bracelet, right? That, that came with a lot of investment, a lot of work. But you see these investments here, and I just want to make sure that we see um, that our commercial colleagues are doing it, right? They're driving uh, 32 billion just in the first three years of this, uh, this year on data center infrastructure. Well, do we need all that? Are we actually gonna need the amount of compute that we're investing in by the time we get there? Or will we evolve as we go? If we get better at our data management, I mean, there's already companies and some here that can already index data at the fraction of the amount of compute needed. Think about the dial-up and where we went from dial-up when we thought, oh, we're going to have to have all these big pipes, right, to where we are now with streaming, right? We, we evolved as we went, right? So there's a lot of investment being done here, and I just hope that we can bring some of that uh, to bear on the missions and the IC. And then I'm going to go back. I'm going to try this. Look at me. How fancy. Oh. Why, then, from what I just showed you on those slides, did you see any numbers that showed investment in skilled workforce? Right? I don't know. I just got back from, uh, from Dubai, and a panel there, a guy talked about the fact that in his kids' daycare, or daycare there's an elective for data science, and his four-year-old is learning Python. What? We, we got to do something, right? So where's the investment in getting a, a workforce? And I don't mean just like raising our digital and data acumen. I'm talking about tradecraft. I'm talking about the people to do the work, the people to write the algorithms in the prompt engineering. On that slide I just showed you, I didn't see any investment in that, right? My point is this. I talk a lot with the leaders, uh, you know, of uh, IC and across uh, with our, you know, our oversight committees and everybody. Why do, are we only investing in two, two or three of these and cutting the rest? We need to invest. We need to innovate. I get it. But why are we doing at it at the expense of everything else that's actually going to make it work? We be, need to be investing in all of these equally. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be like I just told you, like, oh, I got some AI under my chair. Hey, I wish I could use it. Um, so again, we need to straighten out the investment, but you know, that's a bigger problem. We're trying to work. So what are we doing? The IC data reference architecture is based on four principles. Now this is the first IC data reference architecture that the intelligence community has had. And I know that I started <laughs> and worked with Doug and some others that were on the stage earlier from the CIO side, and we were working eyesight. You know, people told us we tried this before. It was so hard. We've tried it for 10 years. Um, how are we going to do this? Um, well, without it, I'm not sure how we get to a place where we scale, right? How do we break down the data silos and have this distributed data ecosystem that we keep talking about? So these are the four principles 
that lead into the data reference architecture. We need to get to a place where we have domain ownership and decentralized stewardship, right? This data ecosystem needs to pull in the data services that we have. It needs to pull in uh, all of the capability that we have. And we need to be able to look and see how we stop the paradigm of trying to think we're going to centralize all the data and pull all of it together. We can't afford to do that. We can't afford to keep duplicating data, right? We need to leave it where it is. And we need to you know, go with the uh, data mesh principles, right? That's a data management approach of where we think about leaving data where it is and how are we going to do that uh, uh, com com combining of the data in a, at the semantic layer, right? We need to leave it where it is. We need to think of data as a product, right? We talked about data flowing freely and securely, but we need to be able to easily discover it, understand the data, access the data securely across multiple domains. We need to use all those things that are the IC data services and also the other services of common concern. We need to do self-service data platform. We need to enable each of the IC elements to do in, within their own elements, but with the idea that we have to have the interoperability across. Right? Everyone's building out their own cataloging. Uh, they have their own data services. They have their own big data repositories. We have to have that data hygiene individually, but we need to be thinking about how we're going to do that at the semantic layer. Right? And then federated uh, computational governance. There's a lot of conversation about governance. A lot of people want to talk about the data and knowledge standards. Right? Well, once we have them, people talk about doing data agreements, MOUs. It's like those laws, right? The speed limit. Like we know we have it. Um, we know we have a data agreement. But in the world that we are in, in an AI enabled world, the data has to ha be tagged and labeled in a way that protects itself all the way through those. And those governance, right? The data handling instructions, the work that we are doing has to be automated. It has to be built in to be able to carry it through so that, because we talked about it, right? Humans can no longer look at and process all of the data. So why do we write a data agreement, a data sharing agreement, and have a piece of paper and say we have it? You can't actually implement that unless you do this work. So these are the four principles. And then I'll show you. I told you last year, the end-to-end -end data management, that was conceptually what we're looking at how we're going to work, how we're going to do this, but what was underneath that we were building out. And so in the middle there is a high level uh, view of the data reference architecture. We have a larger view. Um, that's showing how we're going to do that, how we're going to work together. A lot of people say, oh, is it a requirements document? I would say it's a, I mean, do we want to have data interoperability and do AI at scale? Then yes, these are things we need to do, right? Uh, to be able to get there. And so the data reference architecture that you see there, that's built on those four principles. We've signed it. This is the call to everyone in this room. Now we need to implement it. We need to work together. This is unclassified. The, the actual document that talks about the data reference architecture will be released. Uh, it's unclassified so that we can now work together, right, across not only the intelligence community, but across the intelligence community and the DOD, across the intelligence community with our private sector partners and with our Five Eyes partners. We actually spent 10 months, the last 10 months, building this data reference architecture with input from all of those entities that I just talked about. We had sessions with the private sector. We had uh, all of DOD, our colleagues there, and the IC working together. We adjudicated 800 critical comments. We've even worked with NATO, the NATO Alliance. They have a data quality framework, data reference architecture, if you will. We shared ours with them. We saw theirs. We made some adjustments. The idea now is we've got to work together, and that's why I brought this here so that we can uh, share it with you. We're going to have a session in January. Uh, we're going to have a data and AI summit. One of the things there, I'll be talking about how we're going to do this. We stood up a data operations group this year. Gene over there, hi, he leads it for me. 
Um, data operations is where we're going to look and see how we're going to take mi real mission challenges. There's real mission challenges like we just talked about. And how are we going to do a mission sprint to stress test this? How do we bake this in to how we're doing that end-to-end -end data management? We're going to do one with the Five Eyes. I lead the Five Eyes CDO forum. Uh, we have a Five Eyes data strategy. We have a shared lexicon. We have shared actions we're working with them, right? We're not just leaving it to those four strategic documents. We're going to make it real because I like the art of the possible. I like the fact that AI is out there. I like, I even, I even talk about the, you know, metaverse and immersive technologies. We need all of it. We need every tool in the toolbox. We need everything we're doing to bring to bear on the intelligence community mission, right? And we need to do it and we need to understand the pacing challenge. We can't wait and just think we're just gonna, you know, jump out one day and be like, oh, AI saved us. It's not gonna happen unless we plan for it. And it, unless we implement this planning that we've put together. We've laid out what, what, the, what that looks like. A lot of smart people in this room have participated in that. And now we need to move out. And we need to invest in all of those areas, not just two of them, but we need to have a call to our uh, oversight committees, to our leaders and everyone, that this is a team sport. We gotta work together. We have to innovate, but we can't do it at the expense of all of the foundational work that has to be in place. And we need the workforce to do it. I think that's it. I think I went over my time. I think I had more time, but I've actually come back to this time. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, end uh, with this and just say again, thank you to everyone. Thanks for all the work uh, that has got us to this point. Uh, we have, uh, you know, like I said, we look forward to uh, working with everyone uh, from the DOD, our Five Eyes, and the private sector, and our academic institutions. Oh, God, I almost forgot. I got to say it, Jean. I forgot. Uh, Maria Okumi. Um, we also, uh, in this last uh, month, we awarded uh, UVA, the University of Virginia, um, to, do, to stand up the National Security Data and Policy Institute because our academic partners are just as important to us as everyone else. And that's where we're going to start to flesh out how we do this, how we do it from a data policy, how do we do it from uh, the data innovations that need to happen across that entire end-to-end. -end. So that, uh, we have a kickoff. Uh, there'll be a ribbon cutting, if you will, in the next, uh, in the next month. Uh, so we are not just stopping just with... Um, Again, just leaving it to the strategies. How do we implement this and how do we bring in every single bit of the innovation and the skills uh, that are available to us to help us get this, uh, get this accomplished? And that now, I'm, I'm definitely finished now, Doug. I'm sorry, okay. All right, thanks everyone.